Final two seconds tick off the clock and the New York Rangers win their 41st game. They send the Blues uh, back to a record that's just three games over 500. After getting the shootout win in Philadelphia for the Blues, the Blues have lost their last three games on this road trip and dropped to 32, 29, and 3 on the season. Not easy to have a whole lot of joy or competitive spirit in you when this is the way that it's going right now for the St. Louis Blues alongside Alex and T-Bone. I'm BK. I don't want to hear anything about the schedule anymore. Never again. Because you road stayed road. in one place. Yeah, it was a very tough one road trip. One place for a week. You didn't move. You didn't have to go all over. Yeah, you played a back-to-back -back earlier this week against the Islanders and Philly. It was I a don't grind. care. You found a way to lose all three games in the New York area, four to two, four to one, four to nothing. You'd score a total of three goals. You wouldn't have won any individual game with that effort. And that came over the course of three games. Alongside Alex T-Bone on BK, Alex Doug Armstrong made some comments on Friday about joy and compete. And we saw all of it play itself out on Saturday. Here was the quote that we're going to reference today. I hope our guys can find a little bit of joy back in the game. Right now, when you're around our group, it doesn't look like there's a lot of joy. It doesn't look like there's a lot of excitement to to have this job. And I understand it is a job, And uh, but there's a point where, you know, you, you do all the work in, in June and July and August. You train, you get up early, you take care of yourselves. You Because you, you want to play and have fun in March and April, May and June. And so this is the time of year where I hope our players – find it being the most joyable usually you should come to the rink with a smile on your face with i'd say dj hazy needs to step up his music game in the locker room if the joy's not there t-bone i remember a comment that you made after one of the games i can't remember which one it was honestly but you had one goal that was scored by the jake neighbors line another goal that was scored by the thomas line and you said afterwards when the thomas line scored its goal you're like, it, you might as well have seen the goal go the other looked direction. Like a funeral. Yeah. <laughs> when the Jim Neighbors goal. line scored a goal, it looked like everybody had just scored a game winning goal for the Stanley Cup final. And that is what it feels like right now around this team is that depending on the situation, the line, the depending on a lot of different circumstances, they can either look great and like they're having the best time ever, or they can look terrible on the ice and Usually like they're one. all attending a funeral later on that afternoon or evening or night, whatever the time of the game is. That's where we're at with this club, man. I don't know what more to say. We all kind of know who they are. They're a 500 hockey team that's being elevated by a power play and a really good goalie. Alex, after watching the game on Saturday night, I don't have a whole lot more to add. I think we're playing out the string of this team. We're playing out the string of this season, and we'll see what they're able to do in the offseason. But Friday came and went. Saturday came and went. And I think the next month and a half of the season's got to kind of come and go, and nobody's really going to remember a whole lot from it. Look, it's tough for us to sit here and question effort from individuals because, like, of course they're going out there and trying. But when I hear Doug Armstrong make that comment about the joy isn't there with the players and they're not having fun, first of all, the alarm bells are going off because like what are you talking about you are six points out of a playoff spot and this team doesn't have joy coming to the rink and he's not talking this week i know the trade deadline looming can can take that joy away because of the uncertainty and i get that but this has been going on since post all-star break that's like four weeks removed from the trade deadline i hear doug say that and then i heard the players talk after the game where Jeremy Rutherford, who does great work, asked them about Doug Armstrong's comments. And there was pushback of, look, oh, that's a lot of the joy is in winning. And right now we're not winning, but, but we're out here to get playoff points. Guys, I watched that game against the New York Rangers. BK, just letting you know, I did watch it. Yep. And didn't for, pick up a lot of joy. And, and, no, not really. The first period... They looked like a team that backed up what they were saying. They actually played well against the Rangers, yeah. and a couple of mistakes costed them. But for some reason, in a matter of 18 minutes between one period where you were down by two goals and the next period where you had a shot to get back into the hockey game, it's like the player said, well, this one's out of reach for us. And if the joy is gone for guys when you're six, seven, eight points out of a playoff spot with 18 games to go, and it's not everybody in the locker room because I do see individual efforts in games. But if the joy is gone for a group of guys who last year at this point were like 15 points out of a playoff spot, and now you're sitting eight points out of a playoff spot and the joy's gone, 
If you're Doug, you got a problem. It's a massive problem. This isn't a new head coach fixes it. This isn't a, well, we just got to get some wins under our belt. No, this is a roster problem that they don't know how to get themselves ready for games in playoff season. And if you got guys who can't get themselves ready for roster games, JR pointed out in his athletic piece, this is the fourth oldest roster in the National Hockey League. If that group can't get excited for the playoffs, how do you think guys like Jimmy Snuggerud coming in are going to make this any better? This is a roster problem. And to the point of always going back, because apparently I live in the past of like the coaching problem, this is now the second three-game losing streak that they have had under Drew Bannister. The only losing streak that they had longer than this was under Craig Berube, and it was the four games that led to his firing. You've had two of these in the last, what, month? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, you've sucked for the last month. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, they haven't scored a third-period goal in almost a month at this point. I think not February 17th. Yeah, yeah, that weren't empty netters. Doug Armstrong, by the way, circled the game when he knew. Yeah. yeah. Did you find this interesting, Alex? Do you want to say, when I watch the games, he's well, confirming what I'm seeing. <laughs> He, he circled the game against Nashville. He was like, listen, that was a big game for both teams. And you saw one team take advantage of the opportunity that was in front of them. That was Nashville. You saw another team that went into that game and they saw, oh, our season's over. And that was the St. Louis Blues. And since then, they've they operated like, like they knew their season was over That's after that fine. game. I still will circle the Columbus Blue Jackets game because you were on a five-game win streak. Could have been a six-game win streak, and instead you played the third-worst team in the National Hockey Whenever League. Whenever you circle, those are the two moments, yeah, that right? Was the two, those were the two and moments. And look, in between those was two a games. A bunch of other small moments. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there were two games against Buffalo and Montreal where the Blues were like, hey, we're actually not too bad. It, two games between being bad and being really bad. So they have made some changes to the lineup today, which yes. was nice. Necessary. Good. This Neighbors is, uh, is probably on the top line to start getting some five on five offense. This is how you get it going. Uh, uh, no. What? So they've switched up the lines quite a bit, at least in the top six. Braden Shin no longer a center. Pavel Buchnev, it's your turn. You're going to try it on the second line. That worked in the past. Yeah, okay. Braden Shin's going to be on the top line, according to the practice lineup earlier today. With He'll be on the left wing. So no. With Thomas, who what did not I? skate today, Alexandrov was in his place. Jordan Cairo flanking him on the right. I'm just going to power through here. Bolduke, Buchnevich, and Neighbors. That's your second line. Yeah, that's a good line. Maybe. Saad, Hayes, and Kapanen. That's your third line. And then your fourth line, unchanged, nor should it be. Torpchenko, Sonny Walker. That's one of the only lines that you really know what to get out of. Uh, Letty Pareko, <laughs> stick them together. They have recalled Matt Kessel over the weekend. Hey! He's back. And they've done the right thing. Matt Kessel will be your second pair defenseman along with Tori Krug. That was always the way that it should have been. And Perunovic will be playing with Justin Falk as your third pair it's defenseman. like Kessel should have never been sent down. I, I'm fine with what they've done defensively. In fact, I'm glad that this is what it's going to look like defensively for the foreseeable future. I hope it stays this way, frankly, for a little while. On the lines, like, I just, I don't, I really don't understand it, Alex. I, I don't. I wonder if they want to see what Buchnevich can look like at center again, and this is something where down the stretch, they're like, hey, if we are considering either a trade this offseason, and maybe there were teams that wanted to see if he could be a center for them moving forward, or if you want to give him a potential long-term deal, and part of that is because you think he can be a center long-term, I'm still not just skeptical. I just flat out do not think he's a center. I think that he's too bad on the face-offs, and I just think he's a winger. But fine. The games don't matter, whatever. I don't have a problem with it. I continue to be highly confused by the way that they treat that top line. If they don't think Jake Neighbors can play on the left wing, I would just say, like, he's fine over there. He, he can absolutely do that if you wanted him to. Uh, he Braden did play Shin, on the left wing. I, I know. It, it's very strange to me. But Braden Shin going up there, fine. If you think he's a winger long-term, so do I. I don't think he's a center moving forward for this team. But... Is the way they're going. Alex, your thoughts? I, I just, I don't get the neighbors thing. And I know we've kind of been on this stance. JR asked about it earlier today and he texted us and basically said from Bannister, they like Kyrou playing with Robert Thomas and neighbors contributes where he's at. I don't understand it because in the last 10 games, Jordan Kyrou has one goal, six points, and is a minus seven on that top line where the top line has been non existent. And Jake Neighbors to Bannister saying that he's contributing on the second line. He has two points in his last 10 games and is a minus five. Like, and now you're putting the centerman that was on the line with neighbors that also isn't contributing on a top line that hasn't been contributing. 
I think Shen and Kyrie work well together. I sound like a broken record every time we talk yeah, lines I, here. It just makes zero sense to me of why neighbors who went on a torrid pace there for a while when the line was clicking, why neighbors isn't performing with a top centerman to try and create some five on five offense. It, it genuinely doesn't make sense. You've tried Thomas and Kyrie for now. Oh, yeah. Post Craig Berube firing. But you can continue doing so. That's the thing that I find is weird. Like, if you want Thomas and Kyrou to be together, hell, if they want to be together, it's entirely possible they are telling Bannister, we don't want to be broken up, which is fine, cool, no problem. Put Jake Neighbors up there with him, man. Like, you're moving Buchnevich all around in the top six. He's been a winger on the second line. He's been a center on the second line. He's done everything there. Just put Jake Neighbors on that line. What are you going to learn about Braden Shin with them, man? What are you going to learn? There's nothing to be accomplished with this. We are now in the let's find out what works long term oh, part of the plan. The, the other thing is, if you really want to try this Buchnevich experience at center, then put Shin on his line. So in certain situations where you're like, hey, this is probably not a good spot for a faceoff for Buchnevich, you can just switch him. Oh, you don't want for the face taking the faceoff? So, like, I. All of this just screams, put Shin with Booch and Bullduke, and boom, you're good to go on that second line. Neighbors on the top line. I don't, they have tried everything other than putting <laughs> Jake Neighbors on the top line. Everybody else has gotten an opportunity. I'm surprised they haven't signed Tyler Pitlick to get an Ooh. opportunity up there with him. with the Rangers right now What's winning Josh games. What's doing? I, I saw uh, him on the top over line in last Sweden, year. I think. Well, uh -huh. bring him back because he deserves a chance. Nathan Walker. No. Buddy, get ready. Your time's coming. Sonny. Give it some time, man. You'll be up there, too. Josh Levo, 15 goals and 38 points oh. in the KHL. It's just really weird. It's weird the way that they're approaching this, and I don't understand it. And the I thing don't. that I don't get, like the Drew Bannister comment of, you know, we like where he's at. He's contributing where he's at. That's like saying, man, we got a seven-hole hitter in baseball that's really hot, but we don't want to move him up in the order because he's doing well in the seven-hole. That's not how you operate. That's not how a good team operates. If he's contributing, and look, he's been struggling over the last 10, and honestly, it could just be that everything has gone stale for this Blues yeah. team. But even if Why he's, not put him up at But the even top? if he's struggling, he's still providing the same play that he always provides. That's different than guys that don't provide the same play on a nightly basis. I at least like a guy who I know is going to go in, win a puck battle, come out with it from behind the boards, and create offense. That top line has not been doing it. And I just, they work in pairs. And in Bannister's quote to JR, it's pretty evident. They feel like Thomas and Kyrou was a pair. I'm here to say it's not a pair. And it hasn't been a pair for the last 15 games. Maybe you need to start looking at other pairs that work for this Blues team. Well, the text line said, try Veron up there. Yep. What? Worth a shot. <laughs> Yakub Verona. He'll get an opportunity before Jake the Neighbors, I promise you that. Springfield Thunderbirds. Nine goals in 27 games. There you go. Woof. Bring him back, baby. Bring him back. No. I mean, that line even can't get Drew, much worse defensively, right? E even Drew is done with that one. <laughs> He's Alex Ferrario. That's Tanner Hendrickson. I'm Brandon Kiley. It's time for the funeral. Like, are we, are we getting close to that place for, for the Blues? Like was that essentially term? Friday? Close to that pay, place. I'm in the grieving period yeah, right cool. now, man. Yeah. Uh, now we are... Uh, we're going to have to come up with some kind of a nickname. Last year it was Suck Hard for Bedard. I don't know what this year's is going to be. Suck Hard for Celia Yev, baby. I, I don't think yeah, that you have it. a real shot at the number one overall pick. We don't need a saying. We just need a chant. Everybody in the radio, in boy, their car. You have a very real shot at the number eight overall pick. <laughs> Everybody in their car right now, just start the chant with us. Vegas, 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 Vegas. Oh, yeah, a little Vegas. more enthusiasm, Sphere, please. Sphere, 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 Sphere. It's like shot, 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 shot. Sphere, 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 sphere. Sorry, whoever uses this mic later, I just spit everywhere. But it'll be me. The Blues right now are sitting in the 11th spot when it comes to the the NHL draft. Buffalo is eighth. For context, Buffalo has played one more game than you, and they have two fewer points than you. They actually sold pieces away. So, I mean, you're right. Well, they also they also give it a little time. It was a hockey trade, man. Oh. They got Bo Byram. I just know people wanted their roster, you know. We're going to talk to Katie Wu. She's live down in Jupiter. She's going to come up at 1230 in about 15 minutes. We'll get to a game of something or nothing from the Cardinal spring training that we've seen recently. Uh, something that is definitely something from Cardinal spring training is the injuries that they have right now in the outfield. Newt Bar, two non-displaced rib fractures, which took place on Friday while I was out. 
You also have Tommy Edmond, who, man, I don't even know if he's going to be ready for the first month of the season, much less opening day. What does all of this mean? What does it mean for Victor Scott? How are they going to configure this? We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN. Alongside Alex Ferrario, I am Brandon Kylie. We got to tell you about our friends over at Green Envy because, Alex, I walked outside earlier this morning. It's a beautiful morning here in mm -hmm. St. Louis. And as I looked back at my house, I had the picturesque scene of a green lawn. Oh. Because of Green Envy, they have me taken care of. This all gets started for them in the fall. The great thing about Green Envy is they're going to be taking care of your lawn all year long. They're going to make sure that as we get into the springtime, you are going to be the envy of, the, of your neighborhood because of how fantastic fantastic your lawn looks i've already blocked out a day this weekend to cut my grass spend some time i might even just sit in it and take a good whiff of the grass because of how good it looks but that's what green envy does they make you they make you enjoy your backyard and look this time of the year weeds are going to be a nightmare crabgrass not when you use green envy and also the best part about them is they use products that are formulated for missouri soil and weather conditions so it's not the the generic cheap stuff that you buy over the counter at hardware store so make sure you give them a call have them come out mention bk and ferrario sent you they'll have service professionals take care of your lawn they'll leave you notes of how you can take care of it to keep it green all year long 636-757-1600 that's green envy 636-757-1600 
Ryan Meadows has gone five shutout innings. Nice play by Bill. He'll have only one play. Villalobos was late to the bag. Scott beats him to the first base pillow, and the Cardinals have him loaded. Yeah, certainly not easy with the uh, runner, with uh, Victor Scott flying up the line the way he was. But the little bit of hesitation, and it, it wasn't much, but it was enough. Alongside Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK. That's what it sounded like on Bally Sports Midwest over the weekend. Victor Scott with another nice game for him. Gets on first, is able to steal a bag, ends up uh, scoring as well on that in that inning without really ever getting any kind of big hit in the inning. He creates his own offense. And Alex, Victor Scott, to me, is the man that is officially taking center stage for the Cardinals. As much as last year we talked about Jordan Walker, that was Walker forcing the issue. Walker came into spring as this hyped prospect, and we're all wondering, like, what does he need to do to be able to make the roster? Because we all saw the opening there for him if he took advantage of it. This year, I don't think most people came into spring expecting Victor Scott to have a real opportunity to make the team. And then he came out, looked really good in camp while Tommy Edmond was out. And then it became clear, okay, Edmond's probably not going to be ready for opening day. And now with the news over the weekend that Lars Newbar is going to be out for a while with two non-displaced uh, rib fractures, okay, there's some serious openings right here in the Cardinals outfield. Center field for Edmond, left field for Newbar. What does that mean? John Mosellock met with the media on Friday to give an update on where things stand. He started out by uh, answering a question about Alec Burleson getting an opportunity and left. Well, he's had a very impressive camp, for sure, um, and, and happy for him. And, you know, he's probably going to get an opportunity now, given the injuries we got. So that is what he had to say about Burleson. Now compare that to what he had to say about Victor Scott, Alex. You know, I think we have to be a little bit more patient with that. Um, clearly, he's opened up some eyes early on, but we have still three weeks of camp left, so a lot of time to still make some judgments and decisions. And so we'll see how things go. All right, so Burleson is probably getting the first crack at left field. What about center? If it's not going to be Victor Scott, Mo. Who's going to get the opportunity behind Alec Burleson? We have some options that we could end up putting somebody from the infield out there, too. But we're <laughs> going to try to avoid that if possible. You know, obviously, okay. D.C. is now going to get a lion's share. Okay. Um, we had Walker penciled in in right field from day one. And so that. now we'll just sort of see how that unfolds. But, uh, you know, clearly a, a guy like Sinisi, oh uh, Siani, I'm sorry, is uh, someone like that going to get a lot of opportunities. You got to be kidding me. He just said that a guy is going to get an opportunity as a player. He couldn't even pronounce his can, last name. Can you go back to that part where he's talking about Siani, who might be the starting center fielder on opening day? Like, that's at least in the realm of the possible. Can, can you go to the president of baseball operations for the St. Louis Cardinals describing a player who is very likely to make the opening day 26-man roster as one of the 13 most important position players on the team? Can you have him name him, please? See how that unfolds. But, uh, you know, clearly a, a guy like Sinisi. Uh, Siani, I'm sorry. Sinisi. Is he thinking like Gary Sinise? Sinise? What? What do? What are we doing? I'm not making fun of Mo right now. I'm just talking about how ridiculous uh, it is that Michael Siani might make the opening day roster, and Mo clearly agrees. Guy like <laughs> Sinisi. Sinisi? He said it with a question mark at the end. Guy like, uh, Sinisi? Is that who's on? He was our... waiting for somebody to jump in for him. He was and... waiting for somebody to save him from the disaster that was about to ensue. Lynn Worthy from the St. Louis Post Dispatch was like, Siani? Is that who you're talking <laughs> That's to? That's because Lynn Worthy was probably <laughs> thinking, do you have a Sinisi in camp right now? Are you talking Siani? So, those are the updates. Burleson, yeah, I think he's going to get a lion's share of the opportunities. Carlson, yeah, probably going to be our starting center fielder. Sinisi, no, sorry. Siani is going to be the backup center fielder most likely. Victor Scott, it appears, at least based on right now, Alex, is on the outside looking in. How do you view this current situation of the Cardinals outfield? I, I just don't understand why you have to be patient with Victor Scott. I mean, everything that he's done, and I get it at spring training, so save your angry texts. I, I get that you, you're not comping this to what he's going to see at the major league level but guys am i crazy he doesn't look overwhelmed at at least in spring training i mean i'm looking at it he's got four strikeouts he's got four walks he's got more hits than sinisi and the defense is awesome and the guy is stealing bases 
what else do you need to be patient with with him? Like, again, maybe he looks overmatched when he goes up against elite sure. talent at the major league level. But I would argue Michael Sinisi is going to look overly matched or overmatched against the top level talent. And look, I get it. He's going to probably be like the last guy on the depth chart. This is your Taylor Motter. But I've seen the manager use Taylor Motter in a lot of situations. And if Michael Ciani provides them defense in the outfield, they're going to freaking play him. They're not going to put an infielder in the outfield. It's going to be Dylan Carlson. When that doesn't look good, they're going to go, well, all we've got Ciani. Why not just start it with Victor Scott in the outfield who has speed? Ali Marmol was, was I'm trying to think of the right word here. He was glowing. Thank you. He There's was a little twinkle in his he eye was when he talked about So him. much so like Lil Poppy last year, which didn't work out very well. well. But he was excited about Victor Scott and saying that, look, he gets the extra jump that other guys don't get because of his speed. Quote, he covers a lot of ground. When you have that type of speed, you don't have to have the first step that you want on that first read. You still are able to make up for it because of the speed. He has the combination of all of it. Pretty good jumps, runs it down pretty good, and his routes are good. That is what uh, Ollie Marmel said about Victor Scott over the weekend. Play him. Put Dylan Carlson in left field, have Alec Burleson be your fourth outfielder, and keep Sinisi in the minors. I So I, I do agree that their best defensive alignment probably going into opening day would be Scott and Carlson, where Scott's in center, Carlson's in left, and then you've got Walker in right. But I, I actually don't mind the approach from the Cardinals to take it slow with Victor Scott sure. because he's the kind of prospect that you don't want to rush and then have to send down and hope that the confidence wasn't broken here at the major league level. I don't think that would happen with Victor Scott if you brought him up, and it is, it's probably going to be a month. Like I, I think Tommy Emmons probably going to miss the first month of the season just – Thinking I don't think loud. they know when he's going to be ready. He's had multiple setbacks already in camp where he's trying to progress through his swing and then boom, they have to shut him down again. So I, this is officially concerning with Edmund. Like they've, they've got to get that one figured out. Now the new bar thing, it sucks. It's super painful from everything I understand to live with fractured ribs, but that is... There's at least timelines that you've seen in the past of how you can work your way back from that. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think with Scott, though, I, I just want to take it I don't want to even say cautiously. I would just take it slow. And I think the Cardinals are approaching it right. I think so far he's looked good. And, like, if, if they had to write down their opening day uh, roster today, I would say you put him on the roster. But granted, I also know he hasn't seen a ton of Major League pitching. Like that Marlins game yesterday, they just saw a handful of uh, Major League pitchers. Like the starter wasn't even really a Major Leaguer that they saw at, when he came into the game because Cabrera was hurt. So I think as you progress through spring, you're going to start seeing more of the regular guys on rosters to see how he compares against those guys. And when that happens here in the later, the last, what are we, two and a half weeks left in spring, he plays well the final two and a half weeks of spring. I think he will make the opening day roster. Right now, though, I think he is behind a Alec Burleson. I don't know if I'd put him behind Michael Ciani, but if he's behind Burleson right now, well, that means Burleson's your left fielder, Carlson's your center fielder, and I'm not carrying Victor Scott what, to sit on the bench. What does Burleson do better than Victor Scott to where he should get playing time over him? Hit. I, don't, I think Burleson's bat's better than Scott's right now. Why are we acting like you need a bat in the center field position for this team right now? Guys, there's... There's five dudes that are carrying this offense. And for us to act like you need Tommy Edmonds bat, and if he's not there, well, you got to put Dylan Carlson and Alec Burleson in the lineup. Guys, if William, if Wilson Contreras, Arenado, Goldschmidt, Gorman don't hit, this team is going to stink. I'd much rather have defense that I can lean on when things don't look good on the offensive side than to worry about, well, if I don't have the bat in the lineup, what happens if Burleson doesn't hit? Well, now I got bad defense and a guy who's not hitting over at least somebody who I know is going to get to the ball and when he gets on base is going to steal bases and make my team effective. I, it's a fair point. I actually totally agree with what Alex is saying there. I think your offense is going to be determined this season by, I think it's seven guys, but one of them is out right now with Lars Newt But the six that are still important are there. Like Donovan, Goldie, Gorman, Arenado, Contreras, Walker. I would assume that's your top six in some order. I think it's that order on opening day. Those are the six guys that you're going to be basing whether or not this is a good offense on. They're going to be in your top six at the very beginning of the season. You're going to have a win. You're going to have Carlson. Those two are going to be in your lineup as well. So it really comes down to, okay, how much do you need Burleson's left-handed bat in your lineup compared to what Victor Scott is able to bring you? If your offense is determined early on in the season by whether or not Alec Burleson is a big contributor, then I think you constructed your roster in an inappropriate way. I think the defense in center field for this team is more important. 
I think being good defensively should be the priority, especially early on in the season while you're trying to figure out what do we have with this pitching staff right now? Because frankly, we don't know. You got a lot of guys in the rotation that are still pitched to contact. Your bullpen should be better this year. It's got a lot of swing and miss there. But the rotation, it ain't all that dissimilar from what you had a year ago in the rotation when it comes to the lack of swing and miss. So you're going to need guys that can run the ball down in the outfield. I don't want Carlson or Siani and Burleson and other guys, Donovan who might not be able to throw from the outfield right now. Like I don't need that, that wasn't in my outfield. a problem outfield right for now. Ozuna. I need <laughs> Didn't defense. He have to throw the ball to a center fielder. I need fielder. <laughs> speed. And Victor Scott brings all of that. And so if he shows you in the final three weeks of the of spring training, he's ready to go. And I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that means to them. But for me, it means just looking capable and frankly just playing great defense in center field. I would break camp with him as my starting center fielder on opening day. And I would put Carlson in left because that's your best defensive alignment. I've still got the upside with Carlson. I know we don't believe it. We don't see it, but it's at least there with him. And Victor Scott, I don't know what he's going to look like during the regular season. I do think this is a rush to get him to the major leagues, but his speed can make up for a lack of hitting ability early on. If he's able to get on base like 30% of the time and he's stealing, making up stats here 60% of the time that he gets on so cool we basically got an extra base hit every other time that he gets on base that's something that's valuable and when he's on as my nine hole hitter guess what Donovan Goldie Gorman you're gonna see some better pitches you're gonna get some opportunities there that might not exist without him on this roster so I want to see Victor Scott at this point on the opening day roster barring something unforeseen with him just going into a massive massive meltdown over the next three weeks he can, should be a part of it can i apologize to t-bone t-bone i wasn't yelling at you earlier no, because no, i i totally agree with you like i'm not i think scott should be on the roster right now and i've said this before like we talk, I don't think he will be though to be clear like this is my opinion oh, on what yeah, should happen too. what i think will happen is what you said i think it's going to be burleson and left i think it's going to be carlson and center and i think siani will be your opening oh, yeah. day fourth outfield siani outfield. starting in left today boys yeah see uh, what he looks like I, over there but I, I think the reason they don't want to ru- they don't want to rush him is I think they think there's an upside to him and not just being a defensive center fielder that comes through the system, but a defensive center fielder that has a great bat sure. that can cause havoc on the bases. But I, I'm with you guys. Yeah. I my my opinion is right now he should be their starting center fielder because I think he provides not only something is he elite at he is an elite base runner and can cause havoc if he gets on, but he's also a great defensive center fielder. And Carlson is always projected better as a corner outfielder. Now. If they're going to do that, they need to start getting Carlson reps in left field. Because I don't remember the last time I saw Dylan Carlson in left field. I know he's played he right. Play, yeah, he's I was about to say he played in the corner the other day when Victor Scott was in the lineup. But I think he was at right that yeah, day. It, they need to start getting him reps in left field if they're going to actually Agreed. consider Victor Scott to be their center fielder. And I've said all season, all spring training and in the offseason, when we were talking about Carlson versus Scott, Scott's elite at one thing. Carlson's just good at everything when things are going right. So... I do think that Scott right now should be projected to be on this roster, but I totally understand them wanting to be cautious with it and say, let's see what the next three weeks look like before we actually go full throttle and saying he's going to be here. That's exactly what they did with Walker last year. I'm just so irritated with how they handle these guys with kid gloves and how it just has, like, I I know Walker looks great right now, but it just feels like for how much they always handle these players with kid gloves, it never works out for them. And when you've got somebody who has elite defensive skills and has elite base running skills i want that in my lineup right now when i'm very concerned about my pitching staff i also would say like if they didn't have one of the two injuries if you didn't have the newt bar injury or the Edmund injury i wouldn't be talking like this like i would have totally understood the the way that they would go about it where newt bar or Edmund is on your opening day roster and then carlson gets the other spot i get it that's fair once you get down to the burleson or siani route that's where i say okay the replacement level value here is such that I would just rather have Victor Scott in one of those two spots. And I no longer feel like you're rushing him. Now I feel like, okay, it's worth it. It's worth it to find out what he's going to be. And at some point this year, they're going to have to put him on the 40 man roster. He's going to be a part of your club in 2024. I feel pretty confident about that. It's a matter of when, not if somebody on the text line said, guys, who do you take off of the roster? If you go this route, look at Jared Young or Alfonso Rivas. (laughs) Neither of those two players are going to be contributing members to the team in 2024. And if they are, something's gone horribly awry. And if you need them to be, guess what? You can go find the next version of them. Those guys are a dime a dozen out there on the market. And one of them is going to be replaced at some point this year by Thomas to JC anyways. So those guys are not going to stop me 
from going out and making the move that is necessary. Hell, if you want to get rid of Michael Ciani, you could probably place him through waivers and him not get claimed anyways. You what? can't. So, you can't get Sinise back. What, what I, yeah, your president of baseball operations doesn't even know his guy. Like, you can't even cut him. You don't know who you're cutting. You cut Sinise, and you're like, oh, well, I'm still here. I think he was trying to say it's a JC, and he got it confused with uh, Ciani. And you then always defend Mo. Two, I'm tired but, of it. <laughs> it's, it is a pretty hilarious mistake. I, they should be taking Victor Scott into the opening day roster with him. At Remember this point. that cut from Alavila was like, if if other teams know your players more than you, you got a problem. You don't even know the guy's name. Coming up next, NFL quick hitters, including some of the biggest moves that have already taken place in the legal tampering period. Man, these contracts got signed super quick for them to never have a conversation prior to 11 a.m. this morning. We'll tell you about them next year on 101 ESPN. As it starts to get warmer outside, it means you're flipping on that AC, which means if you haven't had your HVAC system checked out, well, you need to call Classic Air Care. I've already got my scheduled appointment for them to come out with my maintenance program to check it. I do it every six months before I flip the heat on, before I flip the air on, to make sure that it's up to standards. And look, with Classic Air Care, I love the honesty that they have. They come over, they look at it, they clean it, they make sure it's up to par, and then they're telling me, like, this is old, good luck getting through it, but the part about it is I have that protection knowing that look if something goes wrong classic air care is there to help you they've talked with me about purchasing a new HVAC system they're up front they're honest they explain what you need the, the pieces that you don't want to pay extra for I get all of that honesty with classic air care I've been using them for the last six years and if you don't believe me we'll check out their hundreds of reviews up on Google review of 4.8 rating uh, from Jim who says they're they have the absolute best technicians at classic air care I will not let any of them touch my house he knows what he's doing completely trustworthy i've been doing it since 2017 frank is the best so check him out find out why i love using classic air care classic
Terry Hendrickson here with a Sports Center update driven by Johnny Landoff Chevrolet and Johnny Landoff Autoplex. The Blues fell to the Rangers over the weekend, and they'll be back in action tonight as they visit the Boston Bruins. Well, pregame coverage starting at 5 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. Then Joey will join Chris Kerber for puck drop at 6. And the Cardinals getting ready to start up spring training action once again as they will have Miles Michaelis on the mound today as they'll be taking on the Washington Nationals. So the Sports Center update is driven by Johnny Landoff. Find your road shop 24-7 at Landoff.com. Autoplex.com. Are you kidding me? All right, let's dive into some NFL quick hitters. Today is the official start of the legal tampering period no, in the NFL, okay. otherwise known as the day that you can sign the contracts that you've been talking about for two weeks since the NFL went to the NFL Combine. That's that's illegal. That's when all these conversations are actually taking place, but you can't technically have those conversations. So it's more of a like, hey, if your client were to become available, what do you think you'd be looking for? And My then they'd be pearls. like, hey, if he were interested We'd be willing to offer him somewhere in the range of three or sixty-four million dollars with a twenty-seven million dollar guaranteed contract, maybe a fifteen million dollar signing bonus. Is that something that would interest you? Those kinds of things. But we're not like, talking. We're so not talking about it. Though. Across the table while it's like yeah. written on a napkin. This all we're opened not, up talking. less than forty-five minutes ago, and here's where things stand. I'm going to give you guys three signings. You tell me which one interests you the most. You can give me a thought or two on it. The Vikings have signed former Texans edge rusher Jonathan Grenard. We don't have any official contracts on that. Uh, the Bills gave left tackle Deion Dawkins a three-year ex extension worth $60 million after he had tweeted out that he was going to be cut later today. So that was a fun 10 minutes. <laughs> and the Bears have signed running back DeAndre Swift to a three-year deal worth $24 million. Alex, which of those stands out to you as the most interesting? I mean, I like the Swift one, but I'll, uh, the Deion Dawkins ones was the most interesting. Sure. Um, I, you needed that if you're the Bills. I mean, the one thing you got going for you is at least your offensive line somewhat can keep your quarterback standing when he decides not to run into a mass filled with defensive linemen um, but that's the one that would say the most appealing to me it sucks for the Texans to lose their edge rusher especially way, for how good that defense is that deal four years 76 million that includes 42 million guaranteed yeah, so I get, I get the de Texans not giving that to him and that's a desperation move by Minnesota knowing we're going to lose Kirk Cousins we got to do something else so um, and if I'm the Bears I, I don't that's not the one I would have gone after. I would have gone after a, more of a Derrick Henry, Saquon Barkley before I would have gone DeAndre Swift. Uh -huh. So there is one other update on this to continue along with the running back note. Uh, DeAndre Swift, I mentioned three years, $24 million. The Titans have agreed to a deal with a running back as well. Three years, $24 million for Tony Pollard. Ooh. Tony Pollard is going to be headed to Tennessee. Yep. I would not have done Dallas that. Dallas Cowboys running back is now heading to play for the Titans. Oh. Their run with Derrick Henry has officially come to an end. Dallas is getting Derrick Henry, right? I, I wonder if they'll be in on Saquon, but I, I don't know. Derrick Saquon, Henry screams yeah, Dallas. Uh, I don't know that they have the money to do that. Yeah. Well, that's true. Diana Rossini was them, saying honestly. that Saquon's probably going to the team that has a rookie contract, rookie quarterback contract. So according to her, the Eagles and the Texans have expressed the most interest thus far oh. in Saquon Barkley. I, I think Houston makes a ton of sense Agreed. for Saquon. Um, You've been mentioning that for a while, Alex. I, I loved Saquon or Derrick Henry, one of those yeah. two for Houston. I, and I love Saquon because they, they need a pass-catching running back, too, and Barkley would fit that as well. I actually love this green Grenard signing for Houston, or excuse me, for Minnesota, as long as they bring back Kirk Cousins. If they can get Kirk Cousins back, which it doesn't sound like they're going yeah, to, it makes a ton of sense because you you upgrade that defense, which was really solid last year under the run of uh, Brian Flores. And now, but if you lose your quarterback, though, it's just a wash. You know, now you don't have the quarterback. And seeing the reports, are like they're like, oh, Sam Darnold. It's like, oh, gosh, no. Well, yeah. I, if I'm them, I'm trading for Justin Fields. What are 100%. we doing here? What are yeah. How is there nobody that is interested well, in Justin Fields? Do you see the report over the weekend that like some teams don't like value him as much as like a Sam Darnold or a, it's what was that's crazy. trash? That's trash. Like, go go trade for Justin Fields, or if you hate Justin Fields, uh, Washington Jacoby Brissett, just go sign him. He's a more than capable stopgap where you, you're going to pay him $10 million to be a one-year starter. He's going to run your offense the way that you run it to, want it to be run. If you don't want a running quarterback, fine, cool. Jacoby Brissett can come in and be a really solid stopgap option for you if you're the Vikings. So I, I'm baffled by the lack of interest that we are seeing right now across the league in Justin Fields. It makes no sense to me. I'm not telling you he's the second coming. He's this great guy. 
There are some terrible quarterbacks in the league right now that are starting. Justin Fields is better than many of them. If a team convinces themselves that Sam Darnold is their quarterback, just call it like it is. That team is tanking for a top pick. Because Sam Darnold is not your top quarterback. Agreed. Sam Darnold looked as bad as Bryce Young last year. All right, a couple other quarterbacks to get to here. Baker Mayfield signed a three-year deal over the weekend worth up to $100 million. It's really like a two-year $50 million deal. In other words, we finally have the middle-class contract for the NFL. Thank you, Baker yeah. Mayfield, for allowing us to have that. And Russell Wilson, a one-year veteran minimum deal, signed with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Alex, your biggest takeaway from these moves that took place over the weekend? I, I mean, I'm... The Baker Mayfield one makes sense. I'm very glad we have the middle class of quarterbacks now to where we don't have to sit here and talk about giving guys a hundred plus million dollars that are average at best. Tampa's just running it back, which is exactly what we said they were going to do. They signed Evans. They signed Baker. Let's see what we can do and make magic again. The Russell Wilson one is very intriguing to me. Um, it's very obvious that they didn't want to pay a quarterback a lot of money that was out there. They obviously don't want to spend the assets that it takes to, to get Justin Field. I like the move by Pittsburgh. I don't trust Russell Wilson. And frankly, that vibe is a terrible one for that locker room. But man, if there's one team that he goes to that I would say, you know what? I can see it working. It would be with Mike Tomlin as your head coach. So uh, it's a good move by Pittsburgh, but call it like it is. Pittsburgh is a middling team that might make the playoffs, might miss the playoffs. And Russell Wilson is the perfect quarterback for that team. I So I love the Mayfield contract because you stat, you get the middle class. You don't overpay for him like the Giants overpaid for Daniel Jones. You run it back and you know what? Maybe it ends up working out for him and they can be, a, they're at least competitive now still in the NFC South. I hate the Russell Wilson deal. I know it's league minimum. He stinks. What, Pittsburgh's denying a rebuild. It's they just like have, what the Saints do. They're the team that should have traded for Fields. Exactly. I said all along, they, they were the team that made the most sense given who their OC is with Arthur Smith. He wants a guy that can run some play action, deep shots. Justin Fields can do that. And he wants a guy that's mobile. Well, Justin Fields certainly has the mobility as well. I, I, Russell is fine on this contract. I think the opportunity cost of not going to get Fields and instead signing Russell Wilson was a mistake. A hundred percent agree with you. I, I don't like this deal because I just don't think Wilson can play anymore. I, I think he's done. And I know it's a, it's a minimum deal. Man, your backup options, Kenny Pickett. They continue to run it back with Kenny Pickett. Oh, he will be the astounding. quarterback at some time. And, and I totally agree with Alex. We're like, you're bringing in his big ego, if you will, high knee and up and down the plane <laughs> and needs his own people in the in the organization. Man, it just screams nightmare. It just screams if you didn't want to pay for fields and your option B was Russell Wilson, man, let's just admit it's time to tear it apart. Trade what? Trade whatever you can get value for. To me, they scream the New Orleans Saints, a team that has been middling, that won't come to the realization that it is time to tear hmm. it down. Makes sense. They got a middling quarterback like New Orleans did. All right, next one up here. Uh, Diana Rossini just announcing David Bakhtiari has been cut by the Green Bay Packers. Oh, so jet. congratulations You're to new, new York Jets left tackle David Bakhtiari. A big news earlier today in Indianapolis where they have extended franchise tag wide receiver Mike Michael Pittman Jr. I was surprised by these numbers. Maybe I shouldn't have been. Three years, $70 million in this deal for Michael Pittman Jr. Alex, this is essentially what Mike Evans got with one extra year on his contract to stick with the Buccaneers. What did you think of Michael Pittman sticking around for the next three years with the Colts? Man, it's a lot of money to commit to him. I mean, it's a lot of money to commit to him. But, I mean, it's a guy that has shown you he can be your number one wide receiver. Um, I, I don't really go too much off of what he did last year because once you lost Anthony Richardson, you weren't there. So, look, I, I don't think he's my, – I know he's not Mike Evans money worthy. But if you don't have him, you don't have a number one wide receiver. Heck, you don't have a top two wide receiver in that depth chart. So you kind of were forced into doing something because you've got Anthony Richardson and you need weapons around him. I, I love the deal for Michael Pittman. And it's not a long-term deal. I mean, it's three years, but it's, it, yes, the money's high, but it is what Evans got. And I think he is not as comparable to Evans because Evans has a bigger track record. But I, I think it's a better deal for the Colts because hmm. he has – had 1,100 receiving yards with Gardner freaking Minshew at quarterback last year. And he had 925 yards in 16 games the year prior, in which I have no freaking clue who their quarterback was. Uh, Phillip Rivers and the ghost of, or no, the ghost of, I don't remember, Matt Ryan. That's who it was. The ghost of Matt Ryan. And then whoever the hell the backup They're all the quarterback same. was. It's fine. The same <laughs> um, but I, but I, quarterback. I, I love this deal. It's short term. He's younger than Mike Evans. He puts up 1,000 yard receiving uh, seasons, two of the last three. 
I, I love this deal for the Colts. I, I'm glad that they kept him because now you have your number one wide out with Anthony Richardson. A few other things just to pass along for those of you that haven't been able to pay attention throughout the day to day. A lot going on in the NFL. T. Higgins has requested a trade from the Bengals. He is on the franchise tag in Cincinnati. My guess, they ain't trading him. They're going to keep him on the tra on the tag for this upcoming season. He's going to have to be unhappy about it, and they'll all go their separate ways next year. That Kirk always works out well. Kirk Cousins is expected to be, quote, begin discussions, end quote, <laughs> with okay. Atlanta today. His wife is from Atlanta. He's going to Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. Honey, where do you want to play this year? Atlanta? All right. And the Chargers are looking to move on from Joey Bosa at some point this offseason. We talked about that last week. They are in cap hell. It looks like they're going to reset the deck this year, hopefully try to contend again in 2025. And the 49ers, this one was a surprise yesterday, cut defensive lineman Eric Armstead. He was on the cap for $17 million, had just this year left on his deal. Eric Armstead is a really good football player, six foot seven, big defensive lineman. That's really helped them with their pass rush in recent seasons. He has been cut. I will be very curious to see where he lands somewhere like Houston, I think would be very interesting. Mm. I would personally like to see him in Chicago. Oh, so that's your would. latest from across the NFL. We will certainly keep you apprised as anything continues to break in the league as we go along today, being the official start of, let's call it what it is, free agency <laughs> in the NFL. For Alex and T-Bone, I'm BK314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. Questions and answers coming up next.
All right, 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line for questions and answers. You guys get them in right now on the Air Comfort Service text line, and we will give you our answers. You guys can always watch us and ask any questions on YouTube at youtube.com slash 101 ESPN STL. The studio cams are powered by the Air Alliance team. All right, Alex, let's start with this from the 314. Guys, I saw the other night that Minnesota pulled its goalie in overtime and won the game in doing so. Do you think this is a strategy that other teams will start to implement in three on three OT? Should we allow T-Bone to enter the conversation? Should we allow him to enter the chat? He had to hate this. Oh, it's awful. Um, <laughs> now, granted, if you're Minnesota, I understood why Minnesota did it because they're still, I guess, trying for the playoffs. So yeah. they got no like risk at first to get that extra point. I, I think if you saw a playoff team, like I'm not going to say the Blues because they're not really one. Um, Winnipeg. Like v Winnipeg, Vegas, any one of those teams that are like in the playoffs. I don't think they would try it. Well, why not? Because I think it's too risky. Four, four on three. Any one block shot, one turnover. You're going the other way, and it's an but empty if net. There's going no the goal. Other way, and they try to put it in, it's and they icing. miss it. It's icing. Yeah, and yeah. you can't because afford to have penalty. that icing. I, I don't think you'll see a lot of teams try this. I, I, I think should. it's too risky. Too. I think it's a mistake not to. If you have possession of the puck you should pull your goalie to get the four on three opportunity. And then you see where it goes, right? Like it very well may not work, but your odds of winning in overtime are legitimately 50, 50 anyways. So go ahead, give it a shot. Give yourself a little bit of an increased chance to be able to win the game. That's what we're playing for. We're not here to play for the tie. We're here to get that extra point and the best chance to do so is pulling your plus. Goalie. If you're the team that gets the puck and you've got three guys on the ice, they've got four and you receive it in the off or in your defensive zone. It's not easy to skate up the neutral zone and make that play like just skate in easily because there's an extra guy on the ice. So it's a penalty kill situation where if you're that team, you either kill the clock or you try and dump it down to the ice to the empty net. But if that's an icing call and you lose the face off, boy, you are bleeped. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. From the 314, Alex, if you're the Blues, do you still bring up Jimmy Snugger this year? I think it depends on when his season ends and we'll find out I think like in the next two weeks is when you start to get those tournament action games in in, in college hockey I, I don't know the exact schedule with it but look if he could play for this team by the end of March beginning of April I'd consider it I, I think he needs to get his feet wet even if you are burning a year of his entry-level contract um, I, I would lean more towards an amateur tryout and put him on the minor leagues and let him play the rest of the season there. But this is going to come down to what Snuggerud wants to do, because if you're him after another season, man, I'd rather get ready for the off season and training camp to make sure I make this roster. If I sign that contract, I'm not going to be hypocritical. Last year, I said at the end of the Cardinal season when nothing mattered, I think it was worthwhile for Mason Wynn to get those opportunities to find out what it was like at this level to fail. Because that's what's going to happen. Jimmy Snuggard's going to get to the NHL, and he's going to fail more often than he's going to succeed. There will be some successes, but he'll probably fail more often than not. That's good for him. Get that learning opportunity. While these games don't matter, while it's not the most pressure in the world, I would, if he's still willing, I would absolutely want to bring him up at some point for the Blues. So, yeah, I would still say it's worth an opportunity. I, I agree with BK because I, I think the experience matters. And I heard JR say on the balloon party today, you know, even though he could be up on this team full time next year, you're like three years away before you can like lock in what Jimmy Snugger is going to give you production wise because he's going to have to mature, learn the NHL game because it's so much faster than the collegiate level game. So I agree. I, I would give him a run here if he wants to come and play. I think they're probably going to go more the amateur route because they were. I remember last year when this team was struggling, Neighbors was on this team, and they said, we don't want him here in this environment. Yeah. And hearing Doug Armstrong's quote about the trade deadline and what this team is and there's no joy, this is not a good environment to bring a rookie uh, into. People also need to – Snuggeru might want to play another year in college. If he doesn't make the, the, the tournament, he might say, I want one more year. And uh, the Blues can't do anything about that. Like, you can tell them we want you to, to become pro, but – I mean, you got to think the guy hasn't won a national championship, and if he wants an opportunity to do it, what's one more year? So ultimately, his decision, I would say I'd be pretty surprised by that decision, but um, yeah. well, it's his I mean, call. If you're I, him also, if the team's bad, do you want to come back, come sure. to this right away? I do want to pass this along, Alex. i got to be honest with you. I was not aware of this. Uh, did you know that if you were to have an empty net scored on you in overtime, you lose the point from regulation? I did not realize that. That is information that... Uh, I did not know that that was a rule. ...is uh, <laughs> just being presented. That would change my opinion. Yeah, Who presented that to you? A bunch of people on text line. I, I genuinely did not know that. Uh, I apologize. I should have been aware of that. I was not. Um, 
That, yeah, definitely sure. changes things for me. If you're a playoff team and you lose a point by pulling your goalie, uh, first of all, probably smart for the NHL to close that loophole. Uh, otherwise, I do think it would be worth it for every team to go this route. But yeah, that, that definitely changes my opinion on the matter. All right, coming up in about 15 minutes, we're going to get into a game of something or nothing Cardinal Spring Training Edition. But next, is it a positive for the Blues that Jordan Bennington is keeping this team afloat? Or is this long-term going to do more harm than good? We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN. Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my friend and insurance agent Tracy Bibb. Her and her team are always out for you, making sure that you are getting the most competitive rates for your car and home insurance. And look, she's wanting you to save money. And what I love about Tracy is the customer service that you get. She's always in contact with you, letting you know where the prices are at, what falls under that umbrella. And look, if something goes down, whether it's a tree on your shed, like I had a couple of weeks ago, or or whether it's a car accident, you want to have that person that's available for you, and that's Tracy and her team. You give her a call today at 314-328-4260 and tell her you heard me talk about her and her agency here on BK and Ferrario, and she'll give you a free non-committal quote. She'll walk you through everything, and if you decide to go with her, she'll even cancel your previous insurance company that you're with. 314-328-4260. Give her a call today. It's no fib. You're always in great hands hands with the bib. All right, so we can all agree Jordan Bennington has been great this season. This has been a point of contention at times here on this very show. Alex loves Jordan Bennington. I have been 
Oh, don't Mark act like you love him. Of whether or not he's a great regular season goalie. I do think Jordan Bennington, I've always felt Jordan Bennington is fantastic in the playoffs. The regular season is where we have our points of contention, I would say, Alex, in the past. This year, I don't feel that way. Jordan Bennington has been amazing. The only reason that the Blues at any point this year were in conversations about ma making the postseason is because of that guy. You're five on five offense. Guys, do not look it up if you don't want to have like the red alarm bells. Um, <laughs> if you don't want to vomit your breakfast, don't look at it. They're a bottom five team in every five on five category, basically, other than save percentage, which is what's boosting them in that regard. They're biding their time, hoping Jordan Bennington and Joel Hofer can stand on their head and then getting to special teams and they win games there. That's how they're that's what their model has been so far. But Alex, now you're looking at it and it's like, okay, well, this team's not making it to the playoffs. They have almost no chance of that. They have a better chance basically at this point of the number one overall pick than they do at making the postseason. Vegas, 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 So I guess the question probably does, uh, does need to be asked, is this a positive? It's good that you have Jordan Bennington if you're going to make the playoffs soon. But if you're not going to, if this is going to be a longer term retool, rebuild, whatever, having him in net is actually doing you a disservice to a degree of not allowing you the best draft pick possible because he's winning you games that you shouldn't otherwise win and you should be getting a top three to five pick. So where do you fall on this, Alex? Is this a net positive? I mean, it's a really good question because I lean on the side of it's a positive to have Jordan Bennington because if you didn't have Bennington, we'd be talking about this being a rebuild because you'd be talking about finding your next goaltender. You don't know what Joel Hofer looks like, especially if you're throwing him out there 45, 50 games like you've had to use Jordan Bennington this season. And we'd be talking about this being a longer process. The hope is if you put a better team in front of Jordan Bennington, you know that you can compete because you have him but just to play the devil's devil's advocate side of this man i look at what last year was and look he wasn't great last year i still stand firm on the fact that your defense was terrible in front of him and that's why he had an 897 save percentage down the stretch but post trade deadline last year he was six six and one that's 13 points that look if you don't have jordan bennington stealing you those hockey games you're talking about potentially drafting in the top five this year, if you don't have Bennington, I will stand firm on you're talking about drafting top three with Chicago and San Jose and Columbus because Bennington has saved your bacon more than any goaltender in the National Hockey League this season. And if you're a team that's trying to do this fast, at some point you need a generational talent. At some point when you look at the Edmontons, the Colorados, the New Jerseys, and Jack Hughes and Nathan McKinnon and Kale McCarr and the Elias Pettersons for Vancouver – as a fan, you're always like, man, why can't I have that? Well, it's because this team always stays in that 15 to 25 mark, which is good when they're competing. But, man, if you're not going to make the playoffs and you miss the playoffs by three, four, five points, it doesn't benefit you to draft somebody 13th, 14th, 15th overall. You might get a steal of a guy. Like the Blues have found incredible picks with Jake Neighbors and Jimmy Snuggerud. But you're not getting the McDavid's. You're not getting the Jack Hughes. You're not getting the Kale McCars because you're not drafting in that level. And I would say more more than anybody in the NHL, Bennington is the reason that you're drafting anywhere between 10 and 15 this year. Yeah, I, and that's why I think, and I hate to say this, I think it's a bad thing for the St. Louis Blues because he's what keeps them kind of stuck in the middle, if you will. And what is the worst spot to be as a professional franchise? It's stuck in mediocrity. And I'm not even saying that this team's mediocre. This team should be well below 500 if they didn't have Bennington. But because you do, you're always going to have a chance to win games because he can steal them from you. And it's sometimes your top line is going to play well enough to where you can score a couple goals or maybe the power play ends up being well enough to where you end up winning games and maybe Bennington doesn't have his best night. But because you have Jordan Bennington and he's played so well, he is going to keep this team kind of stuck in the middle. And I don't think they can rebuild even if they wanted to because I think they've got bad contracts that they can't get out of. I, I don't think they can get out of some of their contracts to where I don't know if they can even actually enter a rebuild. So they have to kind of retool on the fly, but I don't know if they can get the 
generational type talent without you giving can't. up a significant haul to go trade up into that top five. And most of the time, those NHL teams just aren't going to do that. And you rely on on the deeper draft picks, which, like, look, Dallas right now is a team that I would say is the poster child of this. They've relied on deeper drafts to bring in the Wyatt Johnstons, the Logan Stankovins, who's been really good for them right now. You've got the veterans in terms of Sagan and Hintz and Ben, but... They also drafted Miro Haskin in fourth overall. Like every team that is a, a, a team that's competing for a playoff spot right now has a player on their roster that they have drafted in the top five of the National Hockey League. Like a lot, maybe I shouldn't say every team, but I would say more than 75% of these teams have drafted players in the top five. And for the Blues, man, if you're not doing that, you have to rely on finding those those gems in the middle or deeps and drafts and you have to rely on developing them properly you got to find your thomas hurley like that that's what you need or harley excuse me because he's become a top pair defenseman down in dallas right now and he was a mid first round pick but could you argue but could you argue you don't get that unless you have miro haskin in on your team possibly and and i i think you have your by the way he was a 2019 draft pick it's 2024, I, I, and he's finally now at the place where he is a top pair defenseman. It took five years after that draft to get to that place. I, so we're talking about getting that guy now in this year's draft, and in 2029, they become a top pair defenseman. It's a long time to wait. The only time you get the, the guys that you're talking about are top drafting. five, top seven type and, of And I would argue you have your Thomas Harley and Colton Pareko. Like, I would argue yeah. you have, or Essa Lindell is another player that they found deep in a draft, and he's been really good for them. You've got that guy. You don't have your Miro Haskinen. So to give context on what I'm talking about when it comes to, like, hey, the Blues are really bad at five on five. Um, this is not just an opinion. It's subjectively fact. So they're the third worst team in the NHL this year in Corsi percentage. And for those that aren't familiar with the stat, it's basically how much offense are you generating compared to your opponent, right? Shots in total, not just shots on goal, but shots in total are a big part of this. So they're the third worst team in the league in this regard. The teams that are worse are San Jose and Chicago, two of the worst teams in the NHL. The teams behind them, the next three teams in that regard, Detroit, who's also kind of doing what the Blues are doing, where it's like, yo, I don't know how this is working, but somehow they're in a fringe playoff spot And that's spot why right they now. didn't do anything at the deadline. Because they don't believe in it. They exactly. know that it's all um, fool's gold. Behind them, Montreal and Anaheim. So out of the six worst teams in the NHL at five on five, four of them are drafting in the top six right now, and then there's St. Louis and Detroit that are the quote-unquote outliers, and the Blues are very likely to be in the top eight at some point within the next couple of weeks. And that was that way last year, too. Yeah. Your, your even-strength play was bottom five in the NHL. Your third worst in the nerdy Corsi 4 numbers, your third worst in shots percentage, and your second worst in the NHL at expected goals rate at five-on-five. Five. The only reason you're okay in this regard, you're the eighth-best save percentage at five-on-five. Five. Yeah. That's it. Th this is why... And look, when, when Doug spoke to the media on Friday, he talked a lot about how they didn't want to veer off from the plan that they put in place in terms of this retool. If you're Doug, you have to nail this offseason. And by oh, yeah. nail, you have to be aggressive. Tebow mentioned this on Friday because you said when you spoke to the media that, you know, we just felt like there weren't guys available that we could move the assets that we've gained over these last couple of years to go out there and make our team better. Well, the, the three-year retool, three- to four-year retool you put in place, next year is year three. And if you're not making significant moves... I think they view it as year two. I think they view this as year, year one truly of the retool. See, I, the, the, the way I always read it was last year was year one of this trying mm -hmm. to get out of this. And maybe not. Maybe that was I, the maybe that was the ground floor of it all when I'd you traded everybody year was away. Like year zero, where you realize, oh, crap, it's time to seriously consider a retool. And then yeah. this would be officially year one. But either way, depending on how either you look way, at it, I think you, you got to be, be aggressive. somewhat aggressive this off. Because if you're not, the year after, when you're in year three of this, you're still going to be on those bad contracts that put you in this position. He's Alex Ferrario. That's Tanner Hendrickson. I'm Brandon Kiley. In 15 minutes, we're talking to Katie Wu, Cardinals insider for The Athletic. The NFL's offseason is off and running. Today is the unofficial start to free agency. There is another deal that has been announced. The Jaguars are signing former Bills wide receiver Gabe Davis to a three-year contract. The expectation is this means that Calvin Ridley will not be back 
in Jacksonville. Uh, we do not have numbers yet on the deal, uh, but Gabe Davis is expected to be a Jacksonville Jaguar. That's uh, that's interesting for Buffalo. I mean, I know they had Shakir, uh, Shakir last year, and then obviously you got Stephon Diggs, but that uh, that depth you had at the wide receiver position is starting to dwindle if you're Buffalo. Everybody says the cap's not real until it hits you. Uh, when you have a quarterback that starts making the kind of money that Mahomes, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow is getting ready to make, Dak Prescott now makes, the cap suddenly feels very real <laughs> when your quarterback is accounting for 40 to $50 million on a per year basis. That's the reality that the Bills are now living in. That's why you saw a bunch of those cuts last week. It's why you have to start making some really difficult decisions and you can get around it. But when you miss on a free agent deal the way that they did with Von Miller, who's accounting for, I think it's $30 million this year against their salary cap, there's no way around it. At some point, you've just got to make really tough decisions. And it's why when you sign those deals, you better be right. That's why it's so risky at what the Chiefs are doing with Chris Jones. I think it was the right move to bring him back on that $35 million per year basis. But that bill's coming due. At some point in the next three or four years, Jones is not going to be the player that he is right now. They're going to have to cut him, and it's going to hurt. And when that happens, they're going to have to lose somebody from their roster that they don't want to lose because they're paying that kind of a, a salary to Chris Jones. So it gets tough, man. It gets really tough. All right, coming up next, something or nothing, Cardinal Spring Training Edition here on 101 ESPN.
in the air toward right. Jordan Walker drifts back. Look at that ball carry to the wall. It's off his glove. And that's going to rattle into the corner. Run is in. And Anderson's on his way to third. And he'll stand there with two outs. Tough break for Graceffo. It just kept curling away from Walker. And he couldn't corral it. And we're tied at one apiece. That's what it sounded like on Bally Sports Midwest over the weekend as Jordan Walker, unfortunately, has seen some of his defensive issues show up once again early in spring training. He's Alex. That's T-Bone on BK. Alex, I wanted to play a game of something or nothing. We're going to start with Jordan Walker. Something or nothing, the defensive issues that we saw a year ago are showing themselves once again early on in spring. I'll say something because he's working on it. Like, this is the you know everybody's excuse when it comes to spring training. No, oh, they're working things out right now. Uh, some of this is the wind side of things at Roger Dean Stadium. People have talked about how awful it is at this time of the year. But I'll say this is something. I still think we're going to see growing pains from Jordan Walker in the outfield. It's not like in a matter of one off season he's going to go from being bad to being a Gold Glove defender. You're going to have these slip ups. It's just how often do they happen? Yeah, I'm going to say it's something. I I thought that he would go from really bad to average. And watching him so far in spring, I think it's going to go from really bad to just bad. I, I don't know if he's going to get to average at this point. It is improvement, but it, I, it's not at the level I thought. I've seen a couple of misplays on fly balls. I've seen a couple of routes where, like even one when we were at Centene, I think two weeks ago on a Friday, where he doesn't cut the ball off instead of letting it get to, and cutting it off before it gets to the wall, he doesn't. So I, I think this is something. I think it's a little bit alarming for the Cardinals because it's not as much improvement as I thought. Yeah. I think it's something as well, and it is not alarming but concerning to me because this is the year that you needed to see him take a decent step forward. He had a full year now of working on everything in the outfield. That's both in terms of game experience and this winter. I give him a lot of credit for moving down to Jupiter and working basically every day with Jose Okendo. That's that's a lot of commitment by him to improving defensively. The problem is if you don't see the payoff this year defensively with him, and I think he's going to be better. I think we've already seen in spring training. He is not as bad this year as he was last year. If you don't see the payoff in a serious way, we got a text from Lisa who said he's just not an outfielder. He needs to be a first baseman. This is the year in which you would make a call like that. I'm still very hesitant to do so because there is so much more value in him as a right fielder because of his speed, because of his arm, than if you have to move him to first. But... If you don't get the payoff this year, you will probably have to make that choice next offseason. And I do wonder if that is something that is also in the back of their minds as they're thinking about Paul Goldschmidt's yep. future, where it's like, hey, let's take some time, figure out what this team is, also figure out who you are as a player. And we kind of got to figure out if Jordan Walker is going to be an everyday right fielder of the future. If he's not, that is the natural landing spot for Walker is first base. He's not a DH. He's not a third baseman. First base would probably be the place for him. So I do think it's something, and I wish it was nothing. <laughs> All right, next thing up here. Guys, something or nothing. Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson this spring have combined for seven innings, 11 hits, and 11 earned runs allowed. Something. This is like, this is the red alarm light going off for you. The 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 go-to excuse for a lot of people when pitchers don't look good in spring training is oh well they're working on things guys what is lance lynn and kyle gibson working on in spring training with their well, i'd hope Lur lynn's figuring out a curveball well he's not it's fastballs that's what he's going to throw it he's going to throw it on a daily basis and he's giving up hits kyle gibson what does this guy have to work on in spring training nothing he knows exactly who he is and what pitches got him and kept him at the majors for this long these guys aren't working on anything these guys are going to give up a ton of hits and they're going to be hard hits and it's going to come down to your defense to make the plays and if they don't they're going to look like this so this is absolutely something yeah i think it's something as well i think this is who they are they're going to be guys that give up a bunch of runs they're going to give up a bunch of hits and it's not reassuring that that's what you decided to build your rotation on and guys i'd honestly throw matt's into this conversation too he got rocked on saturday and you that know what i'm less worried about but you know, the I can theme I heard from, you know the common theme I heard about Steven Matz, which was alarming because it was what was said last year during his struggles as a starter? I couldn't find my stuff with my off-speed pitch, and I couldn't put guys away. That's the same exact quote I heard in the first week of the season when they had to, checks notes, demote him to the bullpen. So this is something. I Call me alarmed about the rotation, which I've been from day one since they signed those two. I'm going to say it's nothing so far because it's only one start really from Lance Lynn. And we knew that this couldn't even do the start. He got kicked out. We know who Kyle Gibson is. He's going to give up a lot of hits. And it's a matter of, hey, are you able to keep those to singles? And how does the sequencing go? So I, I don't think this is anything yet. 
guys, we know who Lance Lynn and Kyle Gibson are. This, they're not 24. <laughs> they're they're over the hill. They're old. Yeah, so I, I think it's nothing, honestly. All right, something that I do find to be something so far in spring, Helsley, Gallegos, Kittridge, Romero, Middleton, O'Brien, Palante, Fernandez, otherwise known as your potential opening day uh, bullpen. Those eight relievers have combined for 33 innings in the spring, 24 hits, five earned runs in 33 innings, and 32 strikeouts. Guys, something or nothing, these relievers are combining for basically a strikeout per inning and only five earned runs in the 33 innings in which they have pitched. I'm like a mix between something and nothing here. Fence sitter. I know. What else is new? Am I right? Like, here's the thing. It's something because that is... That are really good numbers for a bullpen that I did not have confidence in last year at times. And you're talking about four of these guys, maybe five of these guys, depending on what O'Brien looks like, are impactful pitchers. The other side of it, and why I'm also looking at nothing, is late into games at spring training, you're seeing the bench come off. For you. You're basically seeing minor league players They're for teams. Them for what it's worth, like Gallegos is getting in in like the fourth innings, and yeah. Helsley's getting in like the third inning. But so it's the, still the, the early the Cardinals relievers are also going up against the starters for the most part. Well, but early in, guys. in spring training too, like typically, and maybe I'm off on this, but it feels like that you typically see a lot of the starters go out after two or three innings. But regardless, that's the only side of it that I look at it and say nothing is like you're not seeing the best of the best with those guys but i mean you can't deny how good those numbers look like especially 32 strikeouts i i would say this is something because they got 32 strikeouts which is really impressive and a lot of these guys stuff looks really good like even palante his curveball looks awesome Dude, the death ball that he's been working on yeah i like it it's I, devastating I want to sure. would you say it's deadly yeah, yeah. i would nice. i like it i like the death ball that palante's worked on so i i say this is something and i i think the big reason for it too is kind of what BK was saying. They are seeing a lot of starters by coming in earlier in the games. Now they're going to start to shift towards their roles now that, like, I think Michael is supposed to go, like, four innings today. So they'll start to shift a little bit later into games. But I think this is something. This is a really encouraging sign. I know we talk a lot about, like, hey, are the Cardinals built for the regular season or the postseason? Because it sure feels like they're just building a team for the regular season and they're not going to be able to win in the playoffs. This bullpen that they have started to construct is the type of bullpen that wins in October. Like, they're, they are... I think this bullpen has a chance to be really good, really good. It will require a few things going their way, most notably health, but knock on wood, so far so good in that regard, and Riley O'Brien becoming what he's been so far in spring is really encouraging. Middleton we knew was going to be a good signing. Uh, I like the um, the Kit Ridge move as well. They've got some some really good returns early on so far in spring training. Uh, T-Bone, my computer crashed over here. Do you have the next something or nothing? Yeah, guys, something or nothing. Victor Scott got the start in center field and led off for the Cardinals yesterday. I'd say something, but because John Mose likes the Pobo, nothing. Ollie wants them there. It's pretty obvious, but the president of baseball operations is the one that's going to make the roster decisions, and that's going to come down to, well, we got to be patient with them. So I'm going to say it's nothing. I think it's something. I, I think it is quite telling that they want him hitting at the top of the order, getting the most at-bats possible up there and playing in center field. I'm not saying that this something means that it's like he's a guarantee to be in center field, but they're giving him every opportunity to take the job and run with it. I, if they thought he was going to be in the minor leagues already, he either A, would have been knocked out of camp, or B, he would be hitting like eighth, ninth, not starting a ton of games in center field. He's starting basically every other day. In fact, he's going to get at-bats today. He is listed as one of the guys That's that awesome. is there in this game today. I think they've been handling this right. Like Great. in spring, I think they're playing it off really well with Victor Scott. And then it just becomes a question of like, what's their conclusion from everything they've been doing so far in spring that the process has been good. I'll be very curious to see what the results of that is. And, and to me, the right result is bringing him north with you to to St. Louis, or I guess technically bringing him west with you to L.A. as they go into the opening series of the year. Final thing here, something or nothing. Alec Burleson is batting 375 with an OPS of over 870 so far through the spring. Something or nothing, Alec Burleson in OPS over 870 with an average of 375. Uh, I'm going to say something because I, I, I've always thought he has a better bat than people give him credit for, and I think he could be one of those legit power bats for you from the left side even if it's off of the bench so I i'm gonna say this is something I, I think it's something as well he looks really good and really comfortable in left field and he he's trimmed down this offseason he looks in better shape uh, i haven't gotten the best shape in his life quote yet but we probably uh, should coming. get one of those he gave it a winter uh, warm-up oh, okay. uh, <laughs> I, I think he can be 
I, I think he can be average and left. I know a lot of people, I heard Stalt saying, like, if he's a starting left fielder for a team, you're not a competitive team on Friday with the Newt Bar news. I, I think he can be better in left now that he's We've trimmed down a little bit. Here in San yeah, I, I looked up this today, by the way. You How know, dare you? Defensive run saved, he was a minus four in left. You know who was a minus two defensive run saves in left field for the St. Louis Cardinals? That was a really good offensive player, Matt Holliday. So he's not that far behind in terms of defense behind Matt Holliday. Coming up next, Katie Wu, Cardinals insider for The Athletic. Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my dentist, 100 West Dental. I have my appointment for a year or a month, a six month cleaning, the checkup in about two weeks. And let me tell you, I'm looking forward to it because of the environment that you get at 100 West Dental. It's a brand new office. It's the patient experience is the most important part. And you've been in those dentists where you walk in, it's like the gray walls and the flashing lights. And you're thinking, where the heck am I right now? Man, you don't get that vibe at all when you walk through the doors at 100 West Dental. All the, all, the entire staff, the hygienists are incredible and I love Dr. Pryor who is always about the preventative procedure. What that means is he's talking with you about your teeth, your gums, your tongue, your overall oral health to make sure that it's taken care of in the long run. And for somebody that's had problems specifically with a dentist that didn't do that and had a tumor that was missed, lost seven teeth, I have the anxiety or had the anxiety, but not anymore thanks to 100 West Dental. Give them a call or you could do an online scheduling. You can even do a consultation with Dr. Pryor before you walk through the doors. Check them out, 100westdental.com. Get with the best at 100 West.
Tara Hendrickson here with a Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Auto Plex. The Cardinals currently taking on the Washington Nationals in spring training action as they lead two to nothing in the bottom of the second inning. And Nolan Gorman might make that three nothing with a single there. And the Cardinals again in action against the Washington Nationals. Blues back in action tonight as well as they'll be taking on the Boston Bruins. We'll have bringing coverage starting at five o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. Then Joey will join Chris Kerber for puck drop at six. The Sports Update is driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your road shop twenty four seven at Londoff. Com, on .com. Are you kidding me? Alongside Alex Ferrario and Tanner Hendrickson, I'm Brandon Kylie. It's always good to be able to go down to Jupiter, where Katie Wu is the Cardinals insider for the Athletics. She's joining us live from Cardinals camp. You can give her a follow on Twitter for all of her updates at Katie J. Wu. Katie and the reporters down there were just able to speak with Sonny Gray, the Cardinals' number one starter and previously presumed opening day starter. Katie, what'd you learn from your conversation with Sonny today? Guys, good news out of Cardinals land after Whoa. a week that didn't really have much of it. I'm very happy to bring you some of that. Sonny Gray threw a side session today of 20 pitches. Uh, he described it as a lighter side, uh, wanted to sit between 88 and 90, not overdo it too early, but his final pitch topped out at 92. Really encouraged. Sonny said he fully expects to come out of it feeling fine and uh, tentatively scheduled for his next side session to be a longer, more extended one um, as early as Wednesday or Thursday. So certainly good news to Sonny Gray just one week after that mild hamstring strain back on the mound. So you tweeted this out that he's not going to have to restart his throwing program. What does this mean for his availability early in the season, in your opinion? Just from reading between the lines, I have to imagine the Cardinals aren't telling you anything that in that regard. That's true. Uh, good assumption there. Um, for Sonny, I think it, it, that's obviously an encouraging sign because when you think about where he was prior to this hamstring strain, he was sitting, you know, around three innings. I know he didn't quite get there uh, after his second start due to that injury, but the fact that Sonny doesn't have to restart from zero and build up his arm obviously means he can come back quicker. The key here is not rushing and uh, doing any more damage to that strain. Again, the fact that he was able to get on a mound today, Ollie Marmel said, technically put him a little ahead of schedule, so that's great news. Um, you put that on top of the fact that he won't have to be, he didn't completely shut down that throwing arm, and uh, you can seem a little bit more encouraged about maybe the, the Cardinals indeed uh, being optimistic about his availability going forward forward we still don't know what it means for opening day these next two three days after he recovers after his bullpen will be pivotal but yeah like i said guys a good day here at cardinal camp so katie speaking of excitement i know killer of joy coming into the station right now nice. but we just played a game something or nothing for the spring training and we were talking about lance lynn and kyle gibson this spring seven innings of work 11 hits 11 earned runs where are you at with those two guys um, I think it's far too early for Lance because, you know, he's only had that, that one start, which was entertaining. <laughs> Very it was entertaining. entertaining. Um, and uh, these guys have been through it before. I'd be more concerned if they were guys who didn't necessarily have that major league pedigree. But a lot of pitchers, I mean, you, feel, you see this with Miles Michaelis as well. They're coming in and they're working on things. Of course, you want to execute. You want results. But I thought Kyle was, was pretty candid in his first start explaining that, he was trying to get a feel for his secondary pitches. So he threw a lot of sequences he wouldn't normally throw in a game because these pitchers want to fine-tune their results. Right now, I'll vote nothing on that. Although if the first inning struggles continue to trend in a not-so-great direction, I might change my mind. But for now, it's so early for both of them. They have yet to really either see, like, three, four innings total. Um, I'm not super worried. It's more about fine-tuning and getting their pitches right. All right, Katie. So the big news over the weekend prior to the, the positive update on – um, Sonny Gray was that Tommy Edmond has had like 17 different setbacks so far during spring with his mm -hmm. wrist and Lars Newpar. This one felt a little more straightforward, uh, although obviously incredibly painful as well, two non-displaced rib fractures. So, Newt, let's set that aside for a second. With Tommy Edmond, what's your read on how long this could potentially linger for him? I think it's certainly longer than the Cardinals first initially projected. And that's just, it's unfortunate given how important Tommy Edmond is to this Cardinal staff. Um, it's what, what I think worries me has been the continuous setback. Now, Tommy Edmond told reporters here last week that he got second, third opinions and they have a, a more solid game plan 
setbacks happen in rehab, but the fact that he's not been able to, up until right now, really spend two or three days without feeling any pain and having to be shut down and re-ramp up, I mean, that's just kind of, to me, a sign that there might be a more glaring problem here. So I don't have an ag- like a, a true, honest read on Tommy's situation, but, you know, I think John Mazalock saying it's doubtful for opening day was kind of at that point, yeah, duh. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think it might be a little bit longer uh, where you're looking at, unfortunately for the Cardinals, potentially multiple weeks of the regular season where Tommy Edmond is not available. Um, again, you know, that's just my speculation based on what we know about how his rehab has gone and how it's uh, struggled. But uh, certainly, I guess, if you want to look at the positives there, the Cardinals do have some very enticing options for the outfield that have shown themselves this spring. Yeah, how excited are you for for Michael Sinise to make the roster out of camp, Katie? (laughs) That was classic. That was so good, man. I, I thought I teed you guys up so well, and you caught me off guard. That was really good. Yeah, you 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 put that one on a platter for me. But but in all honesty, I, I, I hold on. No, we can't move off of this. No, we can. Katie, that was one of the most amazing moments of spring so far, and a spring that's had a lot of them. The president of baseball operations talking about their internal options and getting one of the names wrong was just chef's kiss. <laughs> Guys, the amount of times, I think I've got, like, honestly, a borderline six-pack from holding in my laugh sometimes around here because it's, it's just so funny. It's so unintentionally funny around here sometimes. Oh, my gosh. I just really can't wait for, like, the conversation of, hey, Ollie, Michael Sinise is going to make the roster. And I was like, who the bleep is Michael Sinise? Oh, Siani, sorry about that At least that we one. finally got confirmation that Mo isn't yeah. writing a lineup card. That's, so very, that's all I need. Oh, or maybe yeah, he there, is. There, is, there it is. Mo does not write the lineup cards. You heard it here first. Or maybe he does, and there's just some really good editing skills between the front office and the clubhouse. <laughs> but in all honesty, Katie, it does seem like an easy question of why Victor Scott might not make the roster because, well, you know, you don't want to rush the player and the playing time and all of that. But watching him play so far through spring training, he doesn't seem overmatched, and it seems like an obvious answer. He should get a shot. I I couldn't agree more. He's a dynamic talent. He's ready defensively. I mean, he has every game that I've watched, and he's playing a majority of these spring training games for a reason. The Cardinals want to see as much as Victor Scott the second as they can. Um, Watching him play these mind games on the bases with opposing pitchers, I mean, they're missing their spots. They're yanking. They're checking over their, their back shoulder all of the time, and that's an example of how you can impact the game just by getting on base. And I think Victor Scott does that tremendously well. He got thrown out trying to steal his second base of the game yesterday on a picture-perfect throw. Like, I'm talking a video game throw by Christian Bethencourt, and that's the only way you can get this dude out. He's, uh, I think, really shot up the Cardinals' radar, not over the spring, but over the course of the last year. And if you're talking about a guy making, uh, looking to seize an opportunity, this is certainly one. You're going to face the normal questions of, you know, is he ready? Do you want to jumpstart? Do you want to put two rookies? speaking of him and Mason Wynn, and the two most valuable defensive spots in center field and shortstop, especially given how how bad the Cardinals' defense was last year. And I hear all those arguments. Um, I think John Mazalak has been consistent in how he promotes his prospects. They don't do it unless there's a, a, a clear path to playing every day. But I think almost the Cardinals are willing to to look past that because no one else has really run away with the center field job. And there's still like three weeks left, right, of, of before opening day. There's still time for Carlson. Alex Burleson has had a good spring. Uh, Michael Ciani can yes. play a very good defensive center field. Um, but Victor Scott, I think, is the storyline here. And I think the more he keeps this up, the more the Cardinals really have to consider it. Katie Wu is our guest. You can read her great work over at The Athletic and follow her on Twitter at Katie J. Wu. Uh, Katie, so if... If they were to go with Victor Scott in center field, and I'm still skeptical, we know this team very well, and typically they choose the path of least resistance, which means not making the 40-man move. That would have to be required if you brought him on the opening day roster. That being said, if they sh- if they surprised all of us and he's the opening day starting center fielder, what does that mean for Carlson slash Burleson and what they're going to do in left if Newt Bar's not ready, in your opinion? Um, I think if there's one guy that's benefited from this situation, obviously you never want your teammates to get hurt, but Alec Burleson coming into camp, down 10 pounds, uh, taking things really seriously, uh, looks great offensively. Uh, now the next step for him is, like, can he be tested uh, defensively? He can make the routine plays, but can he, you know, get to the hard hit balls, hit your cutoff man, uh, the, the route efficiency, stuff like that. That's how they'll evaluate him. I think Burleson has a more secure spot than Carlson, who if the Cardinals do decide to call up Victor Scott, which, again, 
We don't know for sure. Um, then Carlson goes back to being the roving reserve outfielder, which was the plan for him all along. But Carlson does have a path to claiming that starting center field spot with Edmund out. He just has to hit. And it's not its not just about getting on base. It's the contact rate. You know, the Cardinals want to see harder hit balls. They want to see better at bats uh, from the left side. They want to see an overall more fine-tuned Dylan Carlson. So if they don't see that, then I think the Victor Scott decision becomes a lot more glaring. But if, they, if the Cardinals, again, if they do bring up Victor Scott, it's to play every day, which means Carlson goes back to being the reserve, while Burleson and potentially Brendan Donovan go back to being the rotating corners. All right, in so the outfield. follow up on that, because I find that to be really interesting. Nobody has had a better runway in terms of just opportunity this spring than Dylan Carlson. It's, it's all right there for him. Tommy Edmond has taken zero opportunities from him. He's got a guy behind him that the team believed coming into camp wasn't ready for the opening day team. And now even in left field, if Victor Scott had jumped him, left field is available for him, where he's clearly a better defender than what they had with Alec Burleson. Katie, what are you hearing? What are you seeing with Dylan Carlson? How has he not taken this opportunity? I don't. I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily of him not taking an opportunity. I would say it's his opportunity to lose. Look, we know that Dylan Carlson is a very dependable uh, center fielder, outfielder in general. His defense has never been a question. He's steady. He's fast. He has a strong arm. Like he's all you want from a defender. It's again. Can he hit? And when you look at what Alec Burleson's doing with the bat, there's no question if Burleson can hit. Brendan Donovan, the Cardinals are ramping him up. He's playing third base today, as you guys know. He could see the outfield as soon as next week. Um, and they could put him in the outfield, though they prefer to keep Donnie kind of sticking to the infield just for the sake of less fluidity, less change in the lineup. That was a big problem for them last year, if you guys recall. So for Carlson, it's just going up and showing that he can hit consistently this spring. And if he does that, I think the Cardinals can patchwork this outfield because look the new bar injury isn't expected to be one that's you know weeks and weeks and weeks out like Edmonds could be the Cardinals think that they could essentially maybe even have him back for opening day but if they don't and the Cardinals need a temporary patchwork for a couple of weeks if Carlson's just a decent hitter then that's not his Katie, we always enjoy having you on. Thank you so much for uh, making this work today. I know you guys had a lot to do down there with the game that is taking place and also talking to Sonny Gray. So thank you so much for hopping on with us today. It's always fantastic information. We'll talk with you again next week. You got it, guys, and thanks for the flexibility. Talk to you soon. You got it. Katie. Katie Wu, one of our favorites. She joins us each and every week here on BK and Ferrario throughout the Cardinals baseball season. You can find all of her great work over at The Athletic, where she has a piece right now breaking down the outfield situation, all the injuries, everything like that. All of the latest information is always available to you over at The Athletic. Alex, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with Katie, but I do find it to be really interesting that the talk of Cardinals camp is the outfield. And the guys that have impressed are very clearly Alec Burleson with his bat and Victor Scott with basically everything else. Defense, base running, speed, confidence, all of that stuff. There is an opportunity in center and in left. Carlson should be, to her point, the guy that has the opportunity to lose. And listen, we're not there yet. We still got a couple of weeks, but it sure feels like he's losing it. It sure feels like he's losing his grasp on just being able to take that job and run with it. I think it feels that way because you're not hearing them talk about it. But if I were to put my Cardinals hat on, they're not talking about it because it seems he's guaranteed a spot to start the season. Maybe. And wh why talk? You're talking about Victor Scott because he's the guy that's played well throughout spring training. You're talking about Burleson because it seems, at least in Mo's eyes, Burleson has earned an opportunity to play left field while Newt Bar and Edmund are out. I mean, Dylan Carlson so far this spring, and I understand everybody's working on stuff, and but spring does matter for some guys more than others, and it matters for him. He's three for 21 with one double, one walk, and six strikeouts. Yeah. I, that is not taking advantage of the opportunity in front of you. He I, has an OPS of 370. I just think the Cardinals have already told themselves that Victor Scott's not making this roster, and they know Michael Sinise is making the roster. And if he's going to be that fourth outfielder, Burleson's in left, so there's no real talk that needs to be about Dylan Carlson because he's a temporary fix. He's putting a Band-Aid over a spot until Edmund's back. See, and I, I think you're not talking about him because he's not impressing. And I think if you're not impressing, I think Scott, I think his name, to your point, 
I think it was coming into spring. It was okay. Scott's kind of off in the distance, but now you got two injuries that are playing a factor into this. Scott's actually impressing. Burleson's bats impressing, and Carlson hasn't done really much that's been well so far this year. I, I think it is something that his name's not coming up in any conversation because you hear all the time names that get brought up that are playing well in spring or who's impressing the coaching staff, and that typically translates at some point in the regular season. And I think right now the fact that Carlson's name's not being brought up. He looks like he's fallen out of grace once again. And if that's the case, you know what I feel is going to happen to him coming up in the offseason? I think he's going to be traded for just another bullpen arm like they did with Tyler O'Neill. Yeah, I think that it's starting to trend to that direction. If you missed any of our conversation with Katie Wu, be sure to check it out on the podcast page, 101ESPN.com. The free 101 ESPN app is where you go to find it. It's all presented by Dobbs Tire and Auto Center. And just to rehash one thing she did say at the beginning, which is highly encouraging news for the Cardinals, is that it sounds like Sonny Gray is not going to have to restart, revamp yeah. his throwing program. Program, that's huge which could mean even if he misses opening day i mean it's entirely possible he's ready to go for like the first turn in the rotation where he doesn't technically take his start but it might be a situation where like they have a bullpen option that's available and by the time they get to the need for a fifth starter that start goes to sunny gray Man, so sunny gray fingers your, crossed if he's your fifth starter this season this team is winning a world Feeling series good about it right coming up in about 10 minutes we will continue our countdown of the 20 most important cardinals for the 2024 season but next the junk drawer here on 101 espn
All right, Alex, let's dive into the junk drawer. First of all, I want to say thank you to everybody that I met over the weekend that went to the wedding that I was at for my wife's sister. Congratulations to Christy and Cameron Mercer, the newlyweds. Um, Alex, you would have no idea how many people listen to this show that are from all different walks of life. There was a doctor that I met that apparently listens to the show while she's at oh, the office tell me, the hospital. Oh, tell me you did. What's up, Doc? <laughs> no, I didn't. I should have, oh. but that's on me. Uh, that was good, T-Bone. Restaurant manager that was listening to us, teacher that was listening to us, and I, a bunch of nurses that were listening to us as well. So a lot of people out there apparently find us to be compelling and entertaining throughout the course of the day. Is called a junk drawer or a weird flex? So, no, 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 no. The, re the reason why I say Shut that is because <laughs> I would have never known, based on our text line, <laughs> our YouTube chat, wow, that's a good that there point. are people that actually like listen to this show because they like it. But it's really cool to meet people out um, in public when they are kind to us and tell us all of the nice things about what they get out of the show. The other thing that I wanted to get to today out of the junk drawer, though, Man, remember that Chiefs-Dolphins game in the postseason yeah. where I said, and we all agreed, you couldn't pay me to go to that thing? Well, there was a reason for that. Oh, and there's yes. new storylines that are coming out, including people that are getting appendages amputated because of the frostbite that they had to ensue from going to that Chiefs game. According to a story in Kansas City over the weekend, there are multiple people that have had either fingers or toes amputated since that game because they were exposed to that frigid cold while at Arrowhead Stadium during the Chiefs versus Dolphins game. A reminder, not all games are fun to go to. This was one of them that absolutely was not worthy of you going to see it in person. I, this is going to sound really cruel to say because You're look, say that they deserved it. They did. <laughs> like, look, I understand it could be uh, life threatening issues. Of course, man. But, uh, but you did this to yourself. Am I not? Like, when it's freezing cold outside, you know what I say to myself? I'm not going out football. there oh. because I don't want to jeopardize my health. Wind gusts made it feel like negative 27. You knew what you were doing. I guarantee the people that are in this situation when they said, should we go to this and say, well, what if we get like frostbite? Nah, football game. Who cares? I'll figure it out then. I'll be fine. And this happened to you. So I, it sounds awful. And I know I'm the a-hole saying this right now, but you kind of did this to yourself. <laughs> I'm not going to go out in that type of temperature no matter what because I don't want my toes to fall off. Boo. I, I, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Yep. yep. You, you earned that. Yeah. You earned that response. Yep. I feel bad for these people. I, I mean, I feel <laughs> awful they for them. Toes yeah. and fingers for I to feel awful they bought, for them. They probably bought those tickets a couple weeks in advance. I don't know how long. That's big. That's part of the problem. I, but they but they said, man, I just spent, I don't even know what it would cost. It's a sunk cost. I don't care. Yeah, it's a sunk cost. No. no. I feel bad for them. You know what that sunk cost? Well, now it costed you your toes on top of it. <laughs> I'll jeopardize the $1,500 that I threw away when the news was telling people a week in advance, this is life-threatening type of weather. This type of weather you should not go outside in. It's not like the day of it went from 30 degrees to minus 30 degrees. He, he's not wrong. They did literally say it's dangerous. It is dangerous to be outside for any and extended period of time. the people that lost their toes, I would almost guarantee you said, this, this, worth this, it. Worth it. I'm going. I paid you the money. Thank God. Can you imagine being a Dolphins fan that was like, hey, I finally get to see my team in the playoffs with a real quarterback at the helm, at least allegedly. <laughs> and I'm going to Kansas City where it's going to be a really cool atmosphere. I'm going to see my team in the playoffs you're coming up from south beach <laughs> and that's the game you go to and you lose a toe and, they think and your team and they, lost and they think 50's cold in south well, beach somebody said to be fair alex says i'm not going if it's slightly chilly and other humans yeah and i don't lose toes coming up in 15 minutes the cardinals might have a little something to thomas to jc or is it sinisi or siani i'm not sure one of those three is it worth finding out if he can play a corner outfield spot though we'll tell you coming up in 15 minutes our 20 most important cardinals countdown continues next year on 101 yes Bien.
With Alex Rorio, I'm Brandon Kylie. We got to tell you about our friends over at Circa Sportsbook in Illinois. Alex, this is the largest sportsbook in Vegas, and it is now available in the great state of Illinois. You can get the best sports betting service at your fingertips. The sports Circa Sports Illinois app is the way that sports betting was supposed to be. Maybe you've been limited by some of those other sports books. You start winning, you start winning, and they're like, okay, yeah, we're going to limit the amount of money that you can win moving forward. Not with Circa Sports. They are going to have the money ready. To to go for you and Alex when you win you're going to win the most money possible because of those tight money line splits look this is why when I make those big parlays I use the Circa Sportsbook app because of those tight money line spits, splits and because they're not limiting players based on their winnings everybody has the same limits unlike other sportsbook who are limiting players and they're so confident in that that they advise you to go look at other sports betting apps because they know you'll come back so check them out Circa Sports Illinois if you or someone you know may have a problem with gambling call 1-800-GAMBLER or text ILGAMB to 833-234. The 20 most important Cardinals for the 2024 season. Number 14, Tommy Edmond. In the air to center. That's well hit. Yastrzemski going back to the 390 side. Leaping try. He won't get it. And Tommy Edmond has tied this game with a solo homer. This one hit high in the air to center. Edmond going back up against the wall. Leaps up. Head hauls it in. Another great fence grabbing catch by Tommy Edmond. This guy is incredible in center field. Uh, that's the hope is that we get to see it at some point this year. Tommy Edmond is number 14 on our countdown of the 20 most important Cardinals heading into the 2024 season. Alex, I was amazed, genuinely amazed last year when we got the first opportunity to see Edmond in center field. At first, I was like, are you seriously going to put another infielder into the outfield? We're just going to have three spots in the outfield where it's like infielder, infielder, Jordan Walker and you're one of the outfield kind of an infielder. infielder. Yeah. <laughs> just say it. It's, it's not a good situation. And then I continue to watch him and it's like, man, this guy's better than anybody else they've had out there. Like he is different than watching Harrison Bader in center field because I don't think his routes are necessarily as good as Bader's are. 
but the speed might actually be better than Harrison Bader in center field, and the overall results are like just so smooth. It's really impressive to watch. He does not have the arm, and that is always going to be a critique, a fair critique of Edmund in center field. He also doesn't have great offensive production. He does struggle against right-handed pitching, but against lefties, my God, my God, he's a good player out there. So. Alex, when you think about what Tommy Edmonds' best-case scenario is going to be for the Cardinals this season, what does it look like? No questions about your center field defense. I I can't look at a best-case scenario and say, like, the offense is going to be an impactful bat for you because I know what Tommy Edmonds is. He's a one-side-of-the-plate hitter, and you know when it's that one side of the pitcher, you're going to be good, and when it's not, it's going to look bad. But best-case scenario for me is if if healthy, which right now we're, we're talking about, I never have to worry about the center field position. And it's to the point of what you had when Harrison Bader was here. I don't know if he's going to be a gold glover. Frankly, I would say no. I don't care as much about the arm because, look, if you hit the cutoff, man, you know you got an arm at your cutoff, man, with Mason Wynn. Yep. But I know the routes are going to be good. I know he's going to make the catches when I need him to. And I don't have to worry about center field. That's my best case scenario. Yeah, I think best case scenario, you're looking at a gold glove caliber defender in center field. The arm's not going to be there, as you said. But he's a gold glove caliber defender out there in center field. That was one of many highlights I could choose from in him center field for our open here today. So I think that's the best case scenario. And probably a guy that honestly against a lefty hits near the top of the line. That's why I think this wrist injury, though, Originally, I thought about and said, oh, it's not that big a deal because you're relying on him more for defense than offense because he's probably their potential leadoff hitter against lefties because I don't know if they want to go Donovan or Newbar up at the top against a left-hander. Tommy Edmond doesn't really get on base against lefties, but he does have pop that I think they would like at the top of the order. So I think that's the best case scenario. Leadoff guy against righties and a guy that plays gold glove defense in center. I think it looks a lot like what Kevin Kiermaier did last year for the Toronto uh, Blue Jays. I, he finished the season with a 265 batting average, didn't hit for a ton of power, had like 10 home runs, 20 uh, doubles, played in 129 games, which feels like the best case scenario at this point for Tommy Edmond. And Kevin Kiermaier was a league average hitter with gold glove defense. That is what you're hoping for out of Tommy Edmond this season is that he can give you that mostly from the bottom of your order. The worst case scenario, I think it's more about the injury than anything else. Like, I'm not I'm not expecting a whole lot offensively out of him. If he's 20% below league average offensively this year, in part because of the wrist injury, it just never heals all the way as a hitter. Fine, I can live with that. The worst case scenario, though, is the injury. That he just, this continues to be a problem for him. It's a recurring issue. We've seen this from Carlson at times. We've seen it from Harrison Bader at times with his heel issue. Can you stay healthy out there? Hell, we've seen it from Ed, Tommy Edmond, not where he's missing a ton of games, but where he's playing through stuff. You get to July and August, and he's not the same guy as he was in April or May because he's having to play through so many nagging injuries. I have my fingers crossed, man, that he can kind of work his way through this. And a month into the regular season, we're talking about Edmond at full go, playing Gold Glove Kyle Oliver center field defense and giving you league average offense. I hope that we can have that. I am officially worried, though, that this is going to be something that lingers at least through the first half of the regular season. And if that takes place, it puts a lot of pressure on guys like Victor Scott or Dylan Carlson or Michael Ciani to be legitimate starting everyday center fielders for you for a month, if not more. Yeah, worst case scenario has nothing to do with Tommy Etman and everything to do with the way that this team is going to look without him. Yep. And I think your worst case scenario, if you were smart about it with your roster moves would be to put Victor Scott out there because then you don't have to stress about it. You're good. You know the defense will be fine. I'm not really worried about the bat and how he looks at the major league level, but the problem is the Cardinals won't operate that way. The Cardinals will go with Dylan Carlson. They'll put Michael Ciani out there. They're using Alec Burleson in left field. You're going to have a defensive liability in your outfield because of Tommy Edmonds' injury. And look, if this is a risk thing. I'd be a little concerned that they're rushing him back because they know how bad this is going to look. And if that's a lingering issue, all it takes is one bad play. And you're talking about Tommy Edmond being out for another two to three months. Yeah, I think worst case scenario to his in terms of his offense, I think you see power get sapped. He's kind of a doubles guy. It's I mean, he had 13 home runs last year. I, if this is a risk thing, I'm concerned about what that means for the power from one, his right side, but also just in general. But I think worst case scenario, and the, when I made this list at the time, 
I thought that they didn't have a center field, a true center fielder that could back up Tommy Edmond, that could start if he was out for the first month. That's changed a little bit since campus started because Victor Scott has opened my eyes. But if the Cardinals decide to do service time manipulation or Scott proves he's not ready, I don't feel comfortable with Carlson in center field for the first month. And the way this is trending, it feels like something that's going to either impact him or force him to miss at least the first month of the season. Worst case scenario, you're right. It doesn't just affect Tommy Edmond. It mostly affects the St. Louis Cardinals in their outfield defense. Yeah, so Tommy Edmond in our final list for the show was at number 14, the way we do this. If you're new to our 20 most important Cardinals breakdown, uh, we each put together our own personal list. We do it blind. We don't see where the other people have add their players on the list we put it together that's how we come to the average for the show alex had tommy edmund at number 11 i had him at number 12 and t-bone as you just discussed had him all the way down to number 16 that's why he was lower on him coming on coming into camp i feel pretty good about that like top 10 to 12 ish yeah. range where i was at coming into camp because of the lack of a true backup center fielder that they have available to them and it really to me his importance will come down to their confidence in victor scott if, they're, if they think Victor Scott's ready to go, maybe I was too high on Tommy Edmond in terms of his importance because he could be jumped like that. Victor Scott could take the shop on opening day and never give it back to Tommy Edmond, and it shouldn't shock anybody. But if they're not willing to do that, oh boy, we're going to see Tommy Edmond's importance real quick, and that is a concern for the Cardinals in 2024. At number 14, Tommy Edmond on our countdown of the 20 most important Cardinals. Tomorrow, we'll have another pitcher on our list of the 20 most uh, important Cardinals. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be fun. All right, coming Will up in about 15 minutes, the Cardinals might have something in Thomas to JC. Where is he going to play, though, and how does he fit to this roster? We'll talk about that coming up at 1.30. Coming up next, we're going to give you the latest update on what's going on with the NFL's free agency. Today is the unofficial start of it, and there is a lot happening, including a running back that's going to a surprising landing spot. We'll tell you who that is next here on 101 ESPN. Hey, it's BK, and Victory Men's Health is here to make sure that you unlock your inner champion today. Have you been feeling a little groggy, fatigue? You don't have the same increase in terms of your sex drive. You've lost some of your body hair. Memory's not as good. All of these are potentially uh, symptoms of low testosterone, and you can get them all checked out over at Victory Men's Health. They'll do a lab draw kit to find out where are your numbers with your testosterone and if they are in Indeed low, they'll help you out over at Victory Men's Health. VictoryMensHealth.com is the place where you can go to find out more about them today. They have four great locations across the St. Louis area. One in O'Fallon, Missouri. One in O'Fallon, Illinois. And then two others in town and country. And their brand new location opened up just last month in Sunset Hills, Missouri. So if you've got some problems with low testosterone, maybe some ED issues that you'd like to get checked out, you want some help with weight loss, they can help you out over at Victory Men's Health and at Victory dreamandself.com.
All right, let's dive into some NFL free agency updates. This is the unofficial start to NFL free agency today. And, Alex, there has been a lot of movement throughout how, the league. How is all of this movement happening so fast when, like, free agency hasn't even started it yet? It is pretty amazing that, you know, in the last two hours, not only have teams and agents been able to get in contact with one another, but they, every agent has been able to find out the exact value for their respective clients and have talked to teams and have ironed out all of the details. And signed on the dotted lines. It's pretty amazing. Really, Honestly, it's remarkable. I mean, all of the free agents are done by now. This is like instant communication. Yeah. I'm impressed. Technically, none of these deals are actually done. Sure. Keep that in the back of your mind. We have seen it before okay, where a player will slip. agree to a contract <laughs> with a team and then they end up finding a better deal out there and you see them sign with a new team in two days. That is technically still possible. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Sure. It just almost never happens. Somebody so, do it. <laughs> These are pretty much done for all intents and purposes. It's also a really bad look for the player and the agent if Kirk you were Cousins, to do that. Kirk Cousins, please do this no. for me. He's a respectable man. You I know, like that? I respected Kirk Cousins watching him on Netflix. I would respect him more if he pulled a deuces move on like the Falcons, for oh, example. Don't, don't deuce on anybody. All right, so the latest updates that we've got for you in NFL free agency. The first one, this is a surprise to me, actually. Josh Jacobs has signed... And he's doing so with the Green Bay Packers. Now, you may be saying to yourself, really? Didn't they already have a good running back there in Aaron Jones? The answer is yes, but they really wanted a bigger back to pair with him. Last year, things didn't go as they had anticipated. So Josh Jacobs, instead of spending on the wide receiver room, they're going to be spending on the running back room. Alex, you surprised by this one? No, I'm not. Okay. I mean, I'm surprised that they're sticking with Aaron Jones. And bringing in Josh Jacobs, I'm not surprised that they went out there to get another running back because that's what carried their team last year. And now you know that Jordan Love can perform well. You want to get more weapons to use. It doesn't seem like any of these wide receivers available are worth throwing out there. So now you've got a legit running back that you can use as a check down option if you're Jordan Love. I like the idea of having Aaron Jones. It feels a little bit like what Green Bay's doing is what Detroit just did this year, to where you had that big-time guy that could pick up the yards for you in a dire situation like they had in Montgomery, but then you've got that that weapon to use in special situations like they had with Jameer Gibbs, and that feels like what Josh Jacobs is going to be. Yeah, I'm a little surprised by this, but I, I understand what they're doing, and I kind of like it. Now, to your point of putting that much money into the running back room seems a bit odd for a position that, nobody seems to value across the league anymore but I, I don't mind the signing one two punch of those two guys and they're gonna look Matt LaFleur wants to establish the run to then open up the pass he kind of learned that when he worked with Sean McVay when he was with the LA Rams he worked in Tennessee as the offensive corner which guess what that's kind of what they did there as well so it does make sense from that standpoint I like it and I like the fact that last year they hit so much on their wide receivers in the draft that it allows for this that's the nice thing about getting a, a draft class as right as the Packers did last year. It opens up money for you to be able to spend elsewhere. So um, I, I don't mind it. There's also just not a whole lot of receivers out there that I would be super interested in if I was them. So, yeah, go this route. Make your offense the best version possible. Take some of that pressure off of Jordan Love and have a dominant running bait game going into this season. So I like it. I have not seen, though, the numbers yet. Have you guys seen anywhere reporting on what the exact numbers, deal no. is? Oh, mm. wow. We've got a big one. Who? Oh. Tell me the Texans got somebody. Kirk Cousins has signed. What? This fast? They're just starting the negotiations. Four-year deal. Is he staying in Minnesota? B, he's staying Where in Minnesota. Where do you think he's going? He's staying in Minnesota. This is a BK You've game. You've seen it, t -Bone? He said, yeah. wow. He's staying in Minnesota. Because I was checking for the numbers of Jacobs. I've seen it. Congratulations to Anthony Stalter. He's going. Let's he's go. Going to oh. All right, oh, the oh, Falcons have their have quarterback, flip. ladies and gentlemen. Mrs. Cousins won. Congrats. <laughs> Who could have seen it coming? It never happens. <laughs> Good for it. Dude, that's a... I'm fascinated to see what the numbers are on this deal. Oh, My this guess is four good. years, $200 million. That's, that's where I'll set wow. the over-under. Uh, what's your optimism for that team now? I was thinking four years, 160, 40 mil a year. I think I'll get more. Oh, yeah, I'm going on the 50 a year. I think it's somewhere between 45 and 50 would yeah. be my bet on the, wow. the salary there. What's your optimism on? And you I got... bet you it's about $150 million fully guaranteed at signing. You've got Pitts, London, Bijan, a good offensive line. Defensively, they kept them in games last season. This comes down to the head coach, and if you feel like you got it right, that is the best team in that division. And would you put them in the top five of teams in the NFC? So it's definitely the best team in the division now, I believe. Low bar. I, th I think Detroit's <laughs> better than them. Yeah. 
I think Green Bay is. I, I'm all in on Jordan. I think Jordan Love is a better quarterback. I'm still out Kirk on that Cousins. one. I'm still out on that one. Same. I don't trust Green Bay. I think San Francisco is better. Yeah. I think they are in the tier right now because I think there's a lot of questions right now in Dallas, Philadelphia, and L.A. I think they're in that tier. Yeah. So you're talking about a top five team. And it's a, it's a question of like, where do you rank them within that tier? But I think the top tier to me is Detroit and Green Bay and San Francisco. And then the next grouping will come up from there. So, yeah, I would not be surprised this year if they are a top five team in the NFC. Shouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, they, their biggest issue last year was their quarterback. If they had a competent quarterback, they, they won been, 10 or 11 games and are yeah. probably playing in the division. And I would have been a little afraid of that team. Sure. With a competent quarterback because they had they have the same amount of weapons that it feels like Detroit has been running with to where it's like, damn, I don't know how you stop them on the offensive side with London, with Pitts, with Bijan Robinson. That's a dangerous team. Yeah, Pitts I'm a little questionable about, especially when your new head coach comes in and goes, our first task is to get Bijan the ball, to get London the ball, and then stopped and didn't get to Kyle Pitts. So I'm a little concerned about Pitts and their tight end spot. But you're right. I, I think they are arguably – a top five team, depending on how Kirk Cousins looks coming back off of a significant injury, by the way, to his Achilles. <laughs> the good news is he's not a running quarterback, so it's not yeah. like it's pulling anything out from his game. I think he'll be fine. I, this is a great deal for Atlanta. They're, they're going to be a fun team to watch. Can we talk about the other side of this? Because, oh, yeah, Minnesota's Minnesota Minnesota now has to figure out what they're going to do. They have a huge question at the quarterback position, and this is a team that is supposed to be built right now to contend for 2024. They've got the Justin Jefferson question that is looming. He wants to be paid like a top-of-the-market player, not just wide receiver, but player in the NFL. He wants like $35 million per year. He's worth it. What do you do if you're Minnesota? Do you take a step back? Do you keep pushing? You what, can't what do take you a do? step back. If you have Justin Jefferson, you, and you got to find a way to convince him to stay. Yeah. You can't. you gotta go. You got to go acquire a quarterback. And frankly, the best one that you could get is Justin Fields. Or trade up in the draft and get something of significance. But, I mean, if you're them, if you take a step back, you're blowing it up because you're not going to be able to keep Justin Jefferson, and I don't know how you can compete if you lose your best offensive weapon. you got to go get a quarterback. They're picking 11th to move up in this year's draft. They would probably have to give up 11-42. That's their second-round pick in the next year's first. I think that could get them into, the, like, the top four-ish. question um, you have to ask is the quarterback you draft worth that. And that's where you got to decide, like, do we want Jaden Daniels? Do we want, you're not getting Caleb. Do you want Drake May? Do you want J.J. McCarthy? What, what are you looking how much, for? How much do you like Penix Jr.? Because Penix Jr. impressed at the combine. If you believe he can come in and, and compete with that offense, because look, you can, you can get a quarterback to come in. If you've got a great offensive line and an offense in front of him that he could play with, how much do you trust it? Because you could get him at 11 or if, but here's the thing. If you trade up to get May or Daniels, if you're wrong, Next year's first round pick is going to be a top five pick and you're bleeped. But if you're right, it's more than worthy of that. Absolutely. It, it's worth all of that. And then so Look much. More. Think about Exactly. Think about how Houston feels today. If they didn't have CJ Stroud, man, that team would be in disarray. But they do. And it doesn't matter that they don't have a first round pick this year. They they'll figure it out. Like yep. they, We've got the quarterback. We're good. And that's what Minnesota is hoping to be able to accomplish. I my guess, purely a guess. I bet you they go one veteran, like they bring in a Jacoby Brissett. I don't think they're going to be the team that ends up getting Justin Fields, Jacoby Brissett, and then they'll sit at 11 and see which quarterback is there, whether that's Knicks, McCarthy, Penix, one of those guys that's remaining at 11. I, I think you've got to peg them right now as a real quarterback team at 11 overall. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. I, I think either they wait or I could still see they trade up and sign a veteran. I, I think they could do both routes potentially. I, I think they could trade up, especially depending on what the buzz is around McCarthy and if it's actually real about teams having that much interest in them trade up see if they can get him and then he can kind of develop a year behind whoever they decide to bring in all right a couple other things to pass along here christian wilkins signed a massive deal with the las vegas raiders it's basically 100 million dollars uh, guys what do you think of this move christian wilkins defensive tackle previously with the dolphins really excellent run defender has a good push from the interior as well do you like the Raiders going all in on their defensive line, a pairing mate to be able to go with Max Crosby? That's a lot of money to pay a guy. That that I mean, that's that's difference maker money. And I don't know if Wilkins is a difference maker. 
I'll tell you this, though. Antonio Pierce is backing up what he said about making teams miserable playing against because yep. that signing, along with Max Crosby, is going to be a nightmare for teams in the AFC. So tell you this is a Chiefs fan. I don't love it. Yeah. I mean, he's going to make Mahomes hurt. That's for sure. He's definitely going the Detroit Pistons route. Crosby is the one guy that bothers Mahomes. The, the one guy in the league that consistently gives him problems. I mean, I don't even have a favorite team, and watching Max Crosby play feels like he's in my head through the television. Imagine that guy coming at you on a nightly basis, and now you have to worry about the other side of it with Wilkins. So it's a good move by uh, the Raiders for Antonio Pierce. Yeah, I, I love the move because what's one thing you're going to have to have in the AFC West? A pass rush. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to get into the face of Patrick Mahomes, going to have to get in the face of Justin Herbert. Like, that's one thing that you need. Now, they got to figure out the quarterback spot. And by the way, speaking of quarterbacks, Diana Rossini just tweeted, so now what for the Vikings? We'll look for them to go after Sam Darnold, who also has other suitors. Oh, just, no way. There's no I'm way. You, there's a ton of no. buzz that Sam Darnold's getting another look as a uh, starter. The Minnesota fans should just plan on Justin Jefferson not being here. Unless that, you're drafting why, Penix Jr. at 11 or I don't know somebody. how you could possibly convince. Like, if you're Justin Jefferson and the Vikings come to you and say, hey, we got a great plan. I know you wanted Kirk because they all wanted Kirk back. Like, he, say what you will about him. He's a solid quarterback. He, he, you know what you're getting out of Kirk Cousins, for better or for worse. But if you're Justin Jefferson, he makes your job possible. Sam Darnold doesn't. Every team that has had Sam Darnold has been like, eh, I don't know about Wasn't this experience. Wasn't he on Carolina last year? Well, he was on Carolina two years oh, ago. Okay. The year before that, he was with the Jets. And last year, he was with the 49ers. It, Sam Darnold is the answer to zero questions. If you're asking the question that it ends with Sam Darnold as your starter, you ask the wrong question. Yeah, game that, over. That's why, who'd they just sign earlier? The defensive end. Um, oh, the great greener. Yeah, it made no sense. Because if you're going to lose out on Kirk Cousins and your stopgap answer is Sam Darnold, why did you, A, just waste money on a defensive well, end? Well, they're going for defense over offense. Or, if you're going hear me Darnold, out, they think Darnold's legit. Yeah. There's I think no they're way. wrong. They are wrong. And they yeah, should just no blow think. it up. This is terrible. And by the way, they also, uh, this Kirk Cousins deal probably is going to come in around BK's mark because James Palmer just said his understanding was that the Vikings made a late push. Falcons were confident they would get him. Minnesota created what you would call a bidding war. Yeah. It's going to be like $200 million. Yeah. To Kirk, Kirk way to go, belongs Kirk. in the Business Sports Hall of Fame. Man, way Incredible. Way to go, Kirk. You it, like that. It's amazing. He's, like that. He's going to make like half a billion dollars oh. in his NFL career. And never and, win a Super Bowl. You know what? And he was a backup for the first three When years. I go up to Michigan this July, I'm going to stand outside his beach house and yell, congrats, Kirk. I'm going to stand on the beach and just hold up one of those signs and say, congrats, Kirk. This is amazing. All right, a couple others really quickly here. Uh, Bryce Huff, a defensive end that very few in our audience have ever heard of. He was pretty good for the Jets last year. He signed for $50 million with the Eagles. The Eagles said going into the offseason, hey, our defensive ends didn't play the run. We need to get rid of them. And this guy doesn't play the run. He's exclusively yeah. a pass rusher. Oh. So <laughs> congratulations to the Eagles for really committing to the bit They're gonna the sign. other thing t-bone your rams have signed all of the guards if you are an offensive guard and you are available this offseason the rams have given you 50 million dollars basketball yes. are you happy about it i am i do i, cool. I am happy cool, 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 just cool, make cool. sure matt Sturf stafford doesn't yeah. get hurt that's the goal for well, the rams i mean as we saw this year you keep stafford upright yeah. you're gonna end up being well and they re-signed their number three wide receiver and demarcus robinson Keeping the offense together and, in fact, adding to it. So I, keep, I love it. Keep Grandpa on his feet. You'll be good to go. Now you got to hope see. Cooper Cup. Can you get guards for wide receivers? Because you might need one for Cooper Cup. Eh. Maybe that's Puka. The best available free agents at this point, and it's a small list. Uh, Daniil Hunter, Tyron Smith, Kendall Fuller, Leonard Williams, Calvin Ridley, well, Hollywood Brown. I hope everyone enjoyed the free agency period in the NFL yeah. because we'll talk to you in uh, training camp. If we were talking about hockey, we'd be talking at this point about guys that are like middle six forwards. Uh, if we were talking baseball, we'd be talking about guys that are six hole hitters that are complementary pieces. That's wow. pretty much what remains Let's in free agency. In baseball free agency, yeah. we're still waiting on yeah. the top guys. You're still start. waiting for the starting guys All right, to go. In 15 minutes, we'll hit the BK and Ferrario Rewind. But coming up next, Thomas Ajaysi is making a name for himself in spring training, so much so that most he can't seem to get him off of his mind. What does his future hold here in St. Louis, and where is it positionally? We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN.
Alex Ferrario with you, excited to talk about Ted Drews being open for their 95th season, that famous frozen custard located off of Chippewa, starting the spring season off right. It's going to be 71 degrees later on today. A perfect reason and excuse for you to load the family up in the car and head down to Ted Drews. Man, so many family traditions are made. I still have all of those memories of sitting in the parking lot, enjoying my Oreo concrete. I love me some Ted Drews and now I'm getting my daughters involved in that family tradition. While you're out there, check out all the flavors that they have. You can even buy it in the courts and bring it home with you, which is a perfect late-night snack, but also walk across the parking lot and check out their gift shop. You can shop for Ted Drew's apparel. They've got kids and adults. You've got drinkware. You've got hats. They even got gift cards, the perfect gift to give to somebody that you don't know what to get them. So head on out there off of Chippewa. Ted Drew's famous frozen custard for the 95th season. Ted Drew's. It really is good guys and gals. Tara Henderson here with a Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. Cardinals currently leading the Nationals 4 to 2 in the bottom of the 6th in spring training action. NFL free agency news Saquon Barkley is signing with the Philadelphia Eagles. Kirk Cousins to sign with the Atlanta Falcons and the Blues back in action tonight as they visit the Boston Bruins. Well, bringing coverage starting at 5 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale and then puck drop at 6 with Chris Kerber and Joey V. The Sports Center update is brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling, an independent American and heating and air conditioning dealer.
we have some options that we could end up putting somebody from the infield out there too, but we're going to try to avoid that if possible. You know, obviously, D.C. is now going to get a lion's share. Um, we had Walker penciled in in right field from day one, and so now we'll just sort of see how that unfolds. So that was John Mozeliak when asked over the weekend about what the plans are in left field if they end up being without Lars Newtbar for an extended period of time. I would assume their their hope is that Dylan Carlson runs with a center field job. Uh, Alec Burleson puts to it to rest any questions about his defense and left and your opening day outfield for better or worse is Burleson Carlson and Walker with Siani as the fourth outfielder he can play anywhere purely a defense player you don't have to worry about Victor Scott being added to the 40 man boom go into opening day make it work if that doesn't happen though there are other ways that they can go about this I'm guessing when he says moving an infielder to the outfield he's talking about Brendan Donovan who had surgery on his UCL at the end of last season. Their hope is that they can avoid having him have an extended stint out in the outfield because they don't want him throwing from that kind of distance this early in his rehab. He should be fine, but it's probably better not to find out, not to push it if you don't have to. I don't think he's the only one that they should be talking about, though, in that regard, Alex. And this is a bit non-traditional, but Thomas J.C. is really impressing at Cardinals camp once again at every level in which he has played he hits he hits and hits and hits some more the Cardinals acquired him in the Jordan Montgomery deal at the deadline last year from Texas he hit in the Cardinals system when he got here and now this year in spring training in just 23 at bats understandably it is a very limited sample size he's batting 390 with an OPS over a thousand he's been your best hitter so far this spring and he was the best hitter last year for you down in the minors as well after he was traded here to St. Louis. He's pretty impressive with the bat in his hands. He also doesn't really have a home defensively. He's not going to play second base for you here. He's certainly not going to play shortstop for you here with Mason Wynn now there. I don't think he's got a future at third because you got that Nolan Arenado guy there. This is like Cardinals' biggest dream is to have a utility infielder that they can do whatever we want. And that's what he is. But can you make him just a pure utility player? Is that something that could be in his future? It hasn't been. He has never played in the outfield that I can find any um, any sort of information about in his minor league career. Alex, if they are concerned about the defense from Burleson and they're not totally sure about his bat, if they would like to get another nice right-handed bat in there, the way to do so is to get aggressive and say, hey, for the rest of spring training, Thomas, if you want an opportunity to make this team out of uh out of on opening day there's one path for you to do so it is by becoming a left fielder do you want to find out if you can do it because this is your chance and the rest of spring that is your runway i would give it a shot i i would see what it looks like and find out if he can play out there the problem is you don't have enough protection if it doesn't work and you're playing them out there defensively like if i knew that uh, victor scott was making this team or i saw the improvements of jordan walker and felt like you know what if we got to use him in left field we think we can cover that ground right now it feels like every position is a liability out there and i don't think the cardinals can afford the opportunity to say well let's see if we can get him up to par so he can make this roster on opening day i'm with you i feel like a guy with that type of bat should be coming off of your bench at least in the starting portion of the season but instead you signed both Matt Carpenter and Brandon Crawford to be those pieces for you it just feels like the Cardinals don't know what the hell they're doing and they don't want to rush these guys they want to make sure they're patient with them I, I think he should be on this roster I think you can get away with having a ton of utility guys and using them in different areas the problem is you need certainty in other areas to protect that player. And the Cardinals right now are living with an outfield that's like, well, we don't know what it's going to look like. Yeah, I, I think if they were going to do this, that had any sort of thought process of putting JC in the outfield, it should have been something they decided on in the offseason to really get him work, to work in the offseason. go down but at to, that honestly, time, he didn't feel like he needed it. But I, I would still say that they should be starters. working towards at least continuing to add depth. You know, like I, I never felt... Ca- great about Dylan Carlson as your backup very reactionary in this regard I, I know and I think it's I think it's their problem but I I think this is something that should be not oh spur of the moment oh crap let's throw him in the outfield and see if it works it's gonna I would be shocked if you could l- learn about his outfield defensive skills at Jupiter at this point because it's two and a half weeks and playing outfield down there is impossible because of the way that's why I think you can learn because if he shows he's capable cool <laughs> let's let's find out Let's see what that looks like. And if you watch it and you're like, this is unplayable, guess what? Way better to find that out now 
than it is to find out later. Let's all be honest. Do we think Thomas Sejaci is going to eventually play some outfield for the Cardinals? Like, if he has a future here in St. Louis, do we think that he eventually, at some point in the next couple of seasons, will play in the outfield? I think he has to. I do, too. See, I don't think so. I think they would put not push Donovan to the outfield. Or they would trade all. But then where are you putting Gorman? I would. You would trade Arenado and move Gorman to third. They got to trade something. Like, they're stockpiling you're assets trading again. You're when you're saying, moving Gorman. Let's hold on to everything. That's but, what I think you're holding on to these guys for. Or I have guys already in my infield that I'm comfortable with. I might be moving Jordan Walker to the infield after this season. Might hey, be. Thomas, learn the outfield. You're going to have to do it eventually for this team. He has always said, hey, my best place to play is wherever they need me on any given day. Well, then go ahead and give it a shot. Let's see what it looks like. There, There is almost literally no harm in doing so. Some of the other guys that are getting opportunities out there have no future with this team. So go ahead. See what Thomas and JC can do. Let's find out if he's capable of playing out there. And if the answer is no, cool. Go back to the infield. If the answer is yes, though, you have just added more value to a player that will eventually be most likely a utility piece for you the way that Brendan Donovan is. Playing the outfield is a good thing for him. It's going to help him here. It's going to help him elsewhere. Go ahead and find out. I don't think they will. Coming up next, we'll hit the BK and Ferrario Rewind with Saquon Barkley's future team, and I have the numbers for you on Kirk Cousins' official deal with the Atlanta Falcons. We'll give you that next here on 101 ESPN.
Selection Sunday is almost here. Get signed up to play in this year's Bracket Madness. Pick them challenge at 101ESPN.com. Free to enter this year's top score. Taking home a $250 Amazon gift card and a 101 ESPN prize pack. Check out all of the rules and get signed up to play in the Bracket Madness challenge at 101ESPN.com. It's brought to you by Bud Light and Twin Peaks. Alex, today is the unofficial first day of NFL free agency. Kirk Cousins is the headliner today. He has signed a four-year deal worth $180 million to Hot be the damn. next quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons. It includes a $50 million signing bonus and more than $100 million in guarantees. So there is your deal, $45 million per year for the Falcons. What do you think? Good for them, man. Actually, more good for Kirk because <laughs> there was not $185 million and 50 mil guaranteed coming from the Vikings. I would say it's a little less than that, and he got the Atlanta Falcons to pay more. Uh, so good for him. I think that's the right move by Atlanta. And then I know uh, the uh, Vikings owner was just speaking of their approach this offseason and how they're, they're going to be fully transparent on the quarterback market when they search for the replacement. The fact that you said that, and Sam Darnold's name has been attached to the Minnesota mm. Vikings, do not make sense. I like it for Atlanta. Minnesota should have just torn this thing down to the studs. But Blow it up. They should. Blow it up. But I, I love the deal for A, Kirk Cousins, and B, for the Atlanta Falcons, because now they're a team that can be viewed as a legitimate contender. Kirk Cousins has an injury guarantee that converts to $10 million in 2026. Hey, he's going to get all of his money. All right, <laughs> the is, Eagles, by the way, signed hero. Saquon Barkley, three years, $37 million. <laughs> it's really a $26 million fully guaranteed uh, deal. So it's a two-year deal, $26 million. Good move, in my opinion, by the Eagles. Got to bring in a little bit more for that offense to get things going. Apparently, they are, quote, not done, according to Diana Rossini. So something could be coming on the fast lane with the Ooh, Eagles as okay. well. <laughs> Looking forward to hearing what Stalter and Marshy had to say, oh, the no. Vikings and Command the Falcons Marsh. perspective Poor on the Kirk Cousins situation. That's coming up for the fast lane. And by the way, coming up on 314 Day, celebrate all things STL. It's a free event. All kinds of stuff going on over there. The fast lane broadcasting live from 2 to 6 o'clock on 314 day at Ballpark Village, all courtesy of Sumner One. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow at 11 a.m. Fast Lane coming up next. You're on 101 ESPN. Clearly, uh, a guy like Sneezy.